Book Eight, Part One of Plato's Republic. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anna Simon. The Republic by Plato, translated by Benjamin Jowett. Book Eight, Part One. And so, Glaucon, we have arrived at the conclusion that in the perfect state, wives and children are to be in common and that all education and the pursuits of war and peace are also to be common, and the best philosophers and the bravest warriors are to be their kings. That, replied Glaucon, has been acknowledged. Yes, I said, and we have further acknowledged that the governors, when appointed themselves, will take their soldiers and place them in houses such as we were describing, which are common to all, and contain nothing private or individual, and about their property, you remember what we agreed? Yes, I remember that no one was to have any of the ordinary possessions of mankind. They were to be warrior athletes and guardians, receiving from the other citizens, in lieu of annual payment, only their maintenance, and they were to take care of themselves as of the whole state. True, I said, and now that this division of our task is concluded, let us find the point at which we digressed, that we may return into the old path. There is no difficulty in returning. You implied, then as now, that you had finished the description of the state. You said that such a state was good, and that the man was good who answered to it, although, as now appears, you had more excellent things to relate, both of state and man. And you said further, that if this was the true form, then the others were false. And of the false forms, you said, as I remember, that there were four principal ones and that their defects, and the defects of the individuals corresponding to them, were worth examining. When we had seen all the individuals, and finally agreed as to who was the best and who was the worst of them, we were to consider whether the best was not also the happiest, and the worst the most miserable. I asked you what were the four forms of government of which you spoke, and then Polemarchus and Idamantus put in their word and you began again, and have found your way to the point at which we have now arrived. Your recollection, I said, is most exact. Then, like a wrestler, he replied, you must put yourself again in the same position, and let me ask the same question, and do you give me the same answer which you are about to give me then? Yes, if I can, I will, I said. I shall particularly wish to hear what were the four constitutions of which you were speaking. That question, I said, is easily answered. The four governments of which I spoke, so far as they have distinct names, are, first, those of Crete and Sparta, which are generally applauded. What is termed oligarchy comes next. This is not equally approved, and is a form of government which teems with evils. Thirdly, democracy, which naturally follows oligarchy, although very different. And lastly comes tyranny, great and famous, which differs from them all, and is the fourth and worst disorder of a state. I do not know, do you, of any other constitution which can be said to have a distinct character. There are lordships and principalities which are bought and sold, and some other intermediate forms of government. But these are nondescripts, and may be found equally among Hellenes and among barbarians. Yes, he replied. We certainly hear of many curious forms of government which exist among them. Do you know, I said, that governments vary as the dispositions of men vary, and that there must be as many of the one as there are of the other? For we cannot suppose that states are made of oak and rock, and not out of the human natures which are in them, and which in a figure turn the scale and draw other things after them. Yes, he said, the states are as the men are. They grow out of human characters. Then, if the constitutions of states are five, the dispositions of individual minds will also be five? Certainly. Him who answers to aristocracy, and whom we rightly call just and good, we have already described. We have. Then let us now proceed to describe the inferior sort of natures, being the contentious and ambitious, who answer to the Spartan polity, also the oligarchical, democratical and tyrannical. Let us place the most just by the side of the most unjust, and when we see them we shall be able to compare the relative happiness or unhappiness of him who leads a life of pure justice or pure injustice. 
the inquiry will then be completed. And we shall know whether we ought to pursue injustice, as Thrasymachus advises, or, in accordance with the conclusions of the argument, to prefer justice. Certainly, he replied, we must do as you say. Shall we follow our old plan, which we adopted with a view to clearness, of taking the state first, and then proceeding to the individual, and begin with the government of honour? I know of no name for such a government other than timocracy, or perhaps timarchy. We will compare with this the like character in the individual, and, after that, consider oligarchy and the oligarchical man, and then again we will turn our attention to democracy and the democratical man, and lastly we will go and view the city of tyranny, and once more take a look into the tyrant's soul, and try to arrive at a satisfactory decision." That way of viewing and judging of the matter will be very suitable. First, then, I said, let us inquire how timocracy, the government of honour, arises out of aristocracy, the government of the best. Clearly, all political changes originate in divisions of the actual governing power. A government which is united, however small, cannot be moved. Very true, he said. In what way, then, will our city be moved, and in what manner will the two classes of auxiliaries and rulers disagree among themselves or with one another? Shall we, after the manner of Homer, pray the muses to tell us how discord first arose? Shall we imagine them, in solemn mockery, to play and jest with us as if we were children, and to address us in a lofty tragic vein, making believe to be in earnest? How would they address us? After this manner. A city which is thus constituted can hardly be shaken, but, seeing that everything which has a beginning has also an end, even a constitution such as yours will not last for ever, but will in time be dissolved. And this is the dissolution. In plants that grow in the earth, as well as in animals that move on the earth's surface, fertility and sterility of soul and body occur when the circumferences of the circles of each are completed which in short-lived existences pass over a short space, and in long-lived ones over a long space. But to the knowledge of human fecundity and sterility, all the wisdom and education of your rulers will not attain. The laws which regulate them will not be discovered by an intelligence which is alloyed with sense, but will escape them, and they will bring children into the world when they ought not. Now that which is of divine birth has a period which is contained in a perfect number. But the period of human birth is comprehended in a number in which first increments, by involution and evolution, obtaining three intervals and four terms of like and unlike, waxing and waning numbers, make all the terms commensurable and agreeable to one another. The base of these, with a third added, when combined with five and raised to the third power, furnishes two harmonies, the first a square which is a hundred times as great, and the other a figure having one side equal to the former, but oblong, consisting of a hundred numbers squared upon rational diameters of a square, the side of which is five, each of them being less by one, or less by two perfect squares of irrational diameters, and a hundred cubes of three. Now this number represents a geometrical figure which has control over the good and evil of birth. For when your guardians are ignorant of the law of births, and unite bride and bridegroom out of season, the children will not be goodly or fortunate. And though only the best of them will be appointed by their predecessors, still they will be unworthy to hold their father's places, and when they come into power as guardians, they will soon be found to fail in taking care of us, the muses, first by undervaluing music, which neglect will soon extend to gymnastic, and hence the young men of your state will be less cultivated." In the succeeding generation, rulers will be appointed who have lost the guardian power of testing the metal of your different races, which, like Hesiod's, are of gold and silver, and brass and iron. And so iron will be mingled with silver, and brass with gold, and hence there will arise dissimilarity and inequality and irregularity, which always and in all places are causes of hatred and war. This the muses affirm to be the stock from which discord has sprung wherever arising, and this is their answer to us. Yes, and we may assume that they answer truly. Why, yes, I said, of course they answer truly. How can the muses speak falsely? 
And what do the muses say next? When this court arose, then the two races were drawn different ways. The iron and brass fell to acquiring money and land and houses and gold and silver. But the gold and silver races, not wanting money, but having the true riches in their own nature, inclined towards virtue and the ancient order of things. There was a battle between them, and at last they agreed to distribute their land and houses among individual owners, and they enslaved their friends and maintainers, whom they had formerly protected in the condition of freemen, and made of them subjects and servants, and they themselves were engaged in war and in keeping a watch against them. I believe that you have rightly conceived the origin of the change. And the new government which thus arises will be of a form intermediate between oligarchy and aristocracy. Very true. Such will be the change, and after the change has been made, how will they proceed? Clearly, the new state, being in a mean between oligarchy and the perfect state, will partly follow one and partly the other, and will also have some peculiarities. True, he said. In the honour given to rulers, in the abstinence of the warrior class from agriculture, handicrafts, and trade in general, in the institution of common meals, and in the attention paid to gymnastics and military training, in all these respects this state will resemble the former. True. But in the fear of admitting philosophers to power, because they are no longer to be had simple and earnest, but are made up of mixed elements— and in turning from them to passionate and less complex characters, who are by nature fitted for war rather than peace, and in the value set by them upon military stratagems and contrivances, and in the waging of everlasting wars, this state will be for the most part peculiar. Yes. Yes, I said, and men at this temp will be covetous of money, like those who live in oligarchies, they will have a fierce secret longing after gold and silver, which they will hoard in dark places, having magazines and treasuries of their own for the deposit and concealment of them, also castles which are just nests for their eggs, and in which they will spend large sums on their wives, or on any others whom they please. That is most true, he said, and they are miserly because they have no means of openly acquiring the money which they prize. They will spend that which is another man's on the gratification of their desires, stealing their pleasures, and running away like children from the law, their father. They have been schooled not by gentle influences, but by force, for they have neglected her who is the true muse, the companion of reason and philosophy, and have honoured gymnastic more than music. Undoubtedly, he said, the form of government which you describe is a mixture of good and evil. Why, there is a mixture, I said, but one thing, and one thing only, is predominantly seen, the spirit of contention and ambition, and these are due to the prevalence of the passionate or spirited element. Assuredly, he said, such is the origin and such the character of this state which has been described in outline only. The more perfect execution was not required, for a sketch is enough to show the type of the most perfectly just and most perfectly unjust, and to go through all the states and all the characters of men, omitting none of them, would be an interminable labour. Very true, he replied. Now, what man answers to this form of government? How did he come into being, and what is he like? I think, said Adamantus, that in the spirit of contention which characterises him, he is not unlike our friend Glaucon. Perhaps, I said, he may be like him in that one point, but there are other respects in which he is very different. In what respects? He should have more of self-assertion and be less cultivated, and yet a friend of culture, and he should be a good listener but no speaker. Such a person is apt to be rough with slaves, unlike the educated man who is too proud for that, and he will also be courteous to free men, and remarkably obedient to authority. He is a lover of power, and a lover of honour, claiming to be a ruler, not because he is eloquent, or on any ground of that sort, but because he is a soldier, and has performed feats of arms. He is also a lover of gymnastic exercises, and of the chase. Yes, that is the type of character which answers to timocracy. Such a one will despise riches only when he is young but as he gets older he will be more and more attracted to them, 
because he has a piece of the avaricious nature in him, and is not single-minded towards virtue, having lost his best guardian. Who was that? said Adamantus. Philosophy, I said, tempered with music, who comes and takes up her abode in a man, and is the only saviour of his virtue throughout life. Good, he said. Such, I said, is the timocratical youth, and he is like the timocratical state. Exactly. His origin is as follows. He is often the young son of a brave father, who dwells in an ill-governed city, of which he declines the honours and offices, and will not go to law, or exert himself in any way, but is ready to waive his rights, in order that he may escape trouble. And how does the son come into being? The character of the son begins to develop when he hears his mother complaining that her husband has no place in the government, of which the consequence is that she has no precedence among other women. Further, when she sees her husband not very eager about money, and instead of battling and railing in the law courts or assembly, taking whatever happens to him quietly, and when she observes that his thoughts always centre in himself, while he treats her with very considerable indifference, she is annoyed, and says to her son that his father is only half a man, and far too easy-going adding all the other complaints about her own ill-treatment, which women are so fond of rehearsing. "'Yes,' said Adamantus, "'they give us plenty of them, and their complaints are so like themselves.' "'And you know,' I said, "'that the old servants also, who are supposed to be attached to the family, from time to time talk privately in the same strain to the son, and if they see any one who owes money to his father, or is wronging him in any way, and he fails to prosecute them,' They tell the youth that when he grows up he must retaliate upon people of this sort, and be more of a man than his father. He has only to walk abroad, and he hears and sees the same sort of thing. Those who do their own business in the city are called simpletons, and held in no esteem, while the busybodies are honoured and applauded. The result is that the young man, hearing and seeing all these things, hearing, too, the words of his father, and having a nearer view of his way of life, and making comparisons of him and others, is drawn opposite ways. While his father is watering and nourishing the rational principle in his soul, the others are encouraging the passionate and appetitive. And he, being not originally of a bad nature, but having kept bad company, is at last brought by their joint influence to a middle point, and gives up the kingdom which is within him to the middle principle of contentiousness and passion, and becomes arrogant and ambitious. You seem to me to have described his origin perfectly. Then we have now, I said, the second form of government, and the second type of character. We have. End of Book 8, Part 1「ポッドキャスト」「ポッドキャスト」「ポッドキャスト」「ポッドキャスト」「ポッドキャスト」「ポッドキャスト」「ポッドキャスト」「ポッドキャスト」「ポッドキャスト」「ポッドキャスト」「ポッドキャスト」「ポッドキャスト」「ポッドキャスト」「ポッドキャスト」「ポッドキャスト」「ポッドキャスト」「ポッドキャスト」「ポッドキャスト」「ポッドキャスト」「ポッドキャスト」「ポッドキャスト」「ポッドキャスト」「ポッドキャスト」「ポッドキャスト」「ポッドキャスト」I believe that oligarchy follows next in order. And what manner of government do you term oligarchy? A government resting on a valuation of property, in which the rich have power and the poor man is deprived of it. I understand, he replied. Ought I not to begin by describing how the change from timocracy to oligarchy arises? Yes. Well, I said, no eyes are required in order to see how the one passes into the other. How? The accumulation of gold in the treasury of private individuals is the ruin of timocracy. They invent illegal modes of expenditure, for what do they or their wives care about the law? Yes, indeed. And then one, seeing another grow rich, seeks to rival him, and thus the great mass of the citizens become lovers of money. Likely enough. And so they grow richer and richer, and the more they think of making a fortune, the less they think of virtue. For when riches and virtue are placed together in the scales of the balance, the one always rises as the other falls. True. 
and in proportion as riches and rich men are honoured in the state, virtue and the virtuous are dishonoured. Clearly. And what is honoured is cultivated, and that which has no honour is neglected. That is obvious. And so, at last, instead of loving contention and glory, men become lovers of trade and money, they honour and look up to the rich man, and make a ruler of him, and dishonour the poor man. They do so. They next proceed to make a law which fixes a sum of money as the qualification of citizenship. The sum is higher in one place, and lower in another, as the oligarchy is more or less exclusive, and they allow no one whose property falls below the amount fixed to have any share in the government. These changes in the constitution they effect by force of arms, if intimidation has not already done their work. Very true. And this, speaking generally, is the way in which oligarchy is established. Yes, he said, but what are the characteristics of this form of government, and what are the defects of which we are speaking? First of all, I said, consider the nature of the qualification. Just think what would happen if pilots were to be chosen according to their property, and a poor man were refused permission to steer, even though he were a better pilot. You mean that they would shipwreck? Yes, and is not this true of the government of anything? I should imagine so. Except a city, or would you include a city? Nay, he said, the case of a city is the strongest of all, inasmuch as the rule of a city is the greatest and most difficult of all. This, then, will be the first great defect of oligarchy. Clearly. And here is another defect which is quite as bad. What defect? The inevitable division. Such a state is not one, but two states, the one of poor, the other of rich men, and they are living on the same spot and always conspiring against one another. That, surely, is at least as bad. Another discreditable feature is that, for a like reason, they are incapable of carrying on any war. Either they arm the multitude, and then they are more afraid of them than of the enemy, or, if they do not call them out in the hour of battle, they are oligarchs indeed, few to fight as they are few to rule. And at the same time their fondness for money makes them unwilling to pay taxes. How discreditable! And, as we said before, under such a constitution the same persons have too many callings, their husbandmen, tradesmen, warriors, all in one. Does that look well? Anything but well. There is another evil which is, perhaps, the greatest of all, and to which this state first begins to be liable. What evil? A man may sell all that he has, and another may acquire his property, yet after the sale he may dwell in the city of which he is no longer a part, being neither trader, nor artisan, nor horseman, nor hoplite, but only a poor helpless creature. Yes, that is an evil which also first begins in this state. The evil is certainly not prevented there, for oligarchies have both the extremes of great wealth and utter poverty. True. But think again. In his wealthy days, while he was spending his money, was a man of this sort a whit more good to the state for the purposes of citizenship? Or did he only seem to be a member of the ruling body, although in truth he was neither ruler nor subject, but just a spendthrift? As you say, he seemed to be a ruler, but was only a spendthrift. May we not say that this is the drone in the house who is like the drone in the honeycomb, and that the one is the plague of the city, as the other is of the hive? Just so, Socrates. And God has made the flying drones, Adimantus, all without stings, whereas of the walking drones he has made some without stings, but others have dreadful stings. Of the stingless class are those who in their old age end as paupers. Of the stingers come all the criminal class, as they are termed. Most true, he said. Clearly, then, whenever you see paupers in a state, somewhere in that neighbourhood there are hidden away thieves and cut-purses and robbers of temples and all sorts of malefactors. Clearly. Well, I said, and in oligarchical states do you not find paupers? Yes, he said, nearly everybody is a pauper who is not a ruler. 
and may we be so bold as to affirm that there are also many criminals to be found in them, rogues who have stings, and whom the authorities are careful to restrain by force. Certainly, we may be so bold. The existence of such persons is to be attributed to want of education, ill-training, and an evil constitution of the state. True. Such, then, is the form, and such are the evils of oligarchy, and there may be many other evils. Very likely. Then oligarchy, or the form of government in which the rulers are elected for their wealth, may now be dismissed. Let us next proceed to consider the nature and origin of the individual who answers to this state. By all means. Does not the timocratical man change into the oligarchical on this wise? How? A time arrives when the representative of timocracy has a son. At first he begins by emulating his father and walking in his footsteps. But presently he sees him of a sudden foundering against the state as upon a sunken reef. And he and all that he has is lost. He may have been a general or some other high officer who is brought to trial under a prejudice raised by informers and either put to death or exiled or deprived of the privileges of a citizen and all his property taken from him. Nothing more likely. And the son has seen and known all this. He is a ruined man, and his fear has taught him to knock ambition and passion head foremost from his bosom's throne. Humbled by poverty, he takes to money-making, and by mean and miserly savings and hard work gets a fortune together. Is not such a one likely to seat the concupiscent and covetous element on the vacant throne, and to suffer it to play the great king within him, girt with tiara and chain and scimitar? Most true, he replied. And when he has made reason and spirit sit down on the ground obediently on either side of their sovereign, and taught them to know their place, he compels the one to think only of how lesser sums may be turned into larger ones, and will not allow the other to worship and admire anything but riches and rich men, or to be ambitious of anything so much as the acquisition of wealth and the means of acquiring it. Of all changes, he said, there is none so speedy or so sure as the conversion of the ambitious youth into the avaricious one. And the avaricious, I said, is the oligarchical youth. Yes, he said, at any rate, the individual out of whom he came is like the state out of which oligarchy came. Let us then consider whether there is any likeness between them. Very good. First, then, they resemble one another in the value which they set upon wealth. Certainly. Also in their penurious, laborious character. The individual only satisfies his necessary appetites and confines his expenditure to them. His other desires he subdues, under the idea that they are unprofitable. True. He is a shabby fellow, who saves something out of everything and makes a purse for himself, and this is the sort of man whom the vulgar applaud. Is he not a true image of the state which he represents? He appears to me to be so. At any rate, money is highly valued by him as well as by the state. You see that he is not a man of cultivation, I said. I imagine not, he said. Had he been educated, he would never have made a blind god director of his chorus, or given him chief honour. Excellent, I said. Yet consider, must we not further admit that owing to this want of cultivation there will be found in him drone-like desires as of pauper and rogue, which are forcibly kept down by his general habit of life? True. Do you know where you will have to look if you want to discover his rogueries? Where must I look? You should see him where he has some great opportunity of acting dishonestly, as in the guardianship of an orphan. Aye. It will be clear enough, then, that in his ordinary dealings which give him a reputation for honesty, he coerces his bad passions by an enforced virtue, not making them see that they are wrong, or taming them by reason, but by necessity and fear constraining them, and because he trembles for his possessions. To be sure— Yes, indeed, my dear friend, but you will find that the natural desires of the drone commonly exist in him all the same, whenever he has to spend what is not his own. Yes, and they will be strong in him, too. The man, then, will be at war with himself. He will be two men, and not one. 
but in general his better desires will be found to prevail over his inferior ones true for these reasons such a one will be more respectable than most people yet the true virtue of a unanimous and harmonious soul will flee far away and never come near him i should expect so and surely the miser individually will be an ignoble competitor in a state for any prize of victory or other object of honourable ambition he will not spend his money in the contest for glory so afraid is he of awakening his expensive appetites and inviting them to help and join in the struggle in true oligarchical fashion he fights with a small part only of his resources and the result commonly is that he loses the prize and saves his money very true can we any longer doubt then that the miser and money-maker answers to the oligarchical state there can be no doubt next comes democracy of this the origin and nature have still to be considered by us and then we will inquire into the ways of the democratic man and bring him up for judgment that he said is our method well i said and how does the change from oligarchy into democracy rise is it not on this wise the good at which such a state aims is to become as rich as possible a desire which is insatiable what then the rulers, being aware that their power rests upon their wealth, refuse to curtail by law the extravagance of the spendthrift youth, because they gain by their ruin. They take interest from them, and buy up their estates, and thus increase their own wealth and importance. To be sure. There can be no doubt that the love of wealth and the spirit of moderation cannot exist together in citizens of the same state to any considerable extent one or the other will be disregarded. That is tolerably clear. And in oligarchical states, from the general spread of carelessness and extravagance, men of good family have often been reduced to beggary. Yes, often. And still they remain in the city. There they are, ready to sting and fully armed, and some of them owe money, some have forfeited their citizenship. A third class are in both predicaments and they hate and conspire against those who have got their property, and against everybody else, and are eager for revolution. That is true. On the other hand, the men of business, stooping as they walk, and pretending not even to see those whom they have already ruined, insert their sting, that is, their money, into someone else who is not on his guard against them, and recover the parent sum many times over, multiplied into a family of children." and so they make drone and pauper to abound in the state. Yes, he said, there are plenty of them, that is certain. The evil blazes up like a fire, and they will not extinguish it, either by restricting a man's use of his own property or by another remedy. What other? One which is the next best, and has the advantage of compelling the citizens to look to their characters. Let there be a general rule that every one shall enter into voluntary contracts at his own risk, and there will be less of this scandalous money-making, and the evils of which we were speaking will be greatly lessened in the state. Yes, they will be greatly lessened. At present the governors, induced by the motives which I have named, treat their subjects badly, while they and their adherents, especially the young men of the governing class, are habituated to lead a life of luxury and idleness both of body and mind. They do nothing, and are incapable of resisting either pleasure or pain." very true. They themselves care only for making money, and are as indifferent as the pauper to the cultivation of virtue. Yes, quite as indifferent. Such is the state of affairs which prevails among them, and often rulers and their subjects may come in one another's way, whether on a journey or on some other occasion of meeting, on a pilgrimage or a march, as fellow-soldiers or fellow-sailors, Aye, and they may observe the behaviour of each other in the very moment of danger. For where danger is, there is no fear that the poor will be despised by the rich. And very likely the wiry, sunburned poor man may be placed in battle at the side of a wealthy one, who has never spoiled his complexion and has plenty of superfluous flesh. 
when he sees such a one puffing and at his wit's end, how can he avoid drawing the conclusion that men like him are only rich because no one has the courage to despoil them? And when they meet in private, will not people be saying to one another, Our warriors are not good for much? Yes, he said, I am quite aware that this is their way of talking. And, as in a body which is diseased, the addition of a touch from without may bring on illness, and sometimes even when there is no external provocation, a commotion may arise within. In the same way, wherever there is weakness in the state, there is also likely to be illness, of which the occasion may be very slight, the one party introducing from without their oligarchical, the other the democratical allies, and then the state falls sick, and is at war with herself and may be at times distracted, even when there is no external cause. Yes, surely. And then democracy comes into being after the poor have conquered their opponents, slaughtering some and banishing some, while to the remainder they give an equal share of freedom and power. And this is the form of government in which the magistrates are commonly elected by lot. Yes, he said, that is the nature of democracy whether the revolution has been effected by arms, or whether fear has caused the opposite party to withdraw. End of Book 8, Part 2 Book 8, Part 3 of Plato's Republic This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anna Simon. The Republic by Plato. Translated by Benjamin Jowett. Book 8, Part 3. And now, what is their manner of life, and what sort of a government have they? For, as the government is, such will be the man. Clearly, he said. In the first place, are they not free, and is not the city full of freedom and frankness? A man may say and do what he likes. Tis said so, he replied. And where freedom is, the individual is clearly able to order for himself his own life as he pleases. Clearly. Then, in this kind of state, there will be the greatest variety of human natures. There will. This, then, seems likely to be the fairest of states, being like an embroidered robe which is spangled with every sort of flower. And just as women and children think a variety of colours to be of all things most charming, so there are many men to whom this state— which is spangled with the manners and characters of mankind, will appear to be the fairest of states. Yes. Yes, my good sir, and there will be no better in which to look for a government. Why? Because of the liberty which reigns there. They have a complete assortment of constitutions, and he who has a mind to establish a state, as we have been doing, must go to a democracy, as he would to a bazaar at which they sell them, and pick out the one that suits him. Then, when he has made his choice, he may found his state. He will be sure to have patterns enough. And there being no necessity, I said, for you to govern in this state, even if you have the capacity, or to be governed, unless you like, or go to war when the rest go to war, or to be at peace when others are at peace, unless you are so disposed. There being no necessity also, because some law forbids you to hold office or be a die-cast, that you should not hold office or be a die-cast if you have a fancy. Is not this a way of life which for the moment is supremely delightful? For the moment, yes. And is not their humanity to the condemned in some cases quite charming? Have you not observed how, in a democracy, many persons, although they have been sentenced to death or exile, just stay where they are and walk about the world? The gentleman parades like a hero, and nobody sees or cares. Yes, he replied, many and many a one. See, too, I said, the forgiving spirit of democracy, and the don't care about trifles, and the disregard which he shows of all the fine principles which we solemnly laid down at the foundation of the city, as when we said that, except in the case of some rarely gifted nature, there never will be a good man who has not from his childhood been used to play amid things of beauty, and make of them a joy and a study. How grandly does she trample all these fine notions of ours under her feet, never giving a thought to the pursuits which make a statesman, and promoting to honour any one who professes to be the people's friend. Yes, she is of a noble spirit. 
These and other kindred characteristics are proper to democracy, which is a charming form of government, full of variety and disorder, and dispensing a sort of equality to equals and unequals alike. We know her well. Consider now, I said, what manner of man the individual is, or rather consider, as in the case of the state, how he comes into being. Very good, he said. Is not this the way? He is the son of the miserly and oligarchical father who has trained him in his own habits. Exactly. And, like his father, he keeps under, by force, the pleasures which are of the spending and not of the getting sort, being those which are called unnecessary. Obviously. Would you like, for the sake of clearness, to distinguish which are the necessary and which are the unnecessary pleasures? I should. Are not necessary pleasures those of which we cannot get rid, and of which the satisfaction is a benefit to us? And they are rightly called so, because we are framed by nature to desire both what is beneficial and what is necessary, and cannot help it. True. We are not wrong, therefore, in calling them necessary. We are not. And the desires of which a man may get rid, if he takes pains from his youth upwards, of which the presence, moreover, does no good, and in some cases the reverse of good, shall we not be right in saying that all these are unnecessary? Yes, certainly. Suppose we select an example of either kind, in order that we may have a general notion of them. Very good. Will not the desire of eating, that is, of simple food and condiments, in so far as they are required for health and strength, be of the necessary class? That is what I should suppose. The pleasure of eating is necessary in two ways. It does us good, and it is essential to the continuance of life. Yes. But the condiments are only necessary in so far as they are good for health. Certainly. And the desire which goes beyond this, of more delicate food or other luxuries which might generally be got rid of, if controlled and trained in youth, and is hurtful to the body, and hurtful to the soul in the pursuit of wisdom and virtue, may be rightly called unnecessary. Very true. May we not say that these desires spent and that the others make money because they conduce to production. Certainly. And of the pleasures of love and all other pleasures, the same holds good. True. And the drone of whom we spoke was he who was surfeited in pleasures and desires of this sort, and was the slave of the unnecessary desires, whereas he who was subject to the necessary only was miserly and oligarchical. Very true. Again, let us see how the democratical man grows out of the oligarchical. The following, as I suspect, is commonly the process. What is the process? When a young man, who has been brought up, as we were just now describing, in a vulgar and miserly way, has tasted drones' honey, and has come to associate with fierce and crafty natures, who are able to provide for him all sorts of refinements and varieties of pleasures, then, as you may imagine, the change will begin of the oligarchical principle within him into the democratical. Inevitably. And as in the city, like was helping like, and the change was effected by an alliance from without assisting one division of the citizens, so too the young man is changed by a class of desires coming from without to assist the desires within him, that which is akin and alike again helping that which is akin and alike. Certainly. And if there be any ally which aids the oligarchical principle within him, whether the influence of a father or of kindred, advising or rebuking him, then there arises in his soul a faction and an opposite faction, and he goes to war with himself. It must be so. And there are times when the democratical principle gives way to the oligarchical, and some of his desires die and others are banished. A spirit of reverence enters into the young man's soul, and order is restored. Yes, he said, that sometimes happens. And then, again, after the old desires have been driven out, fresh ones spring up, which are akin to them, and, because he, their father, does not know how to educate them, wax fierce and numerous. Yes, he said, that is apt to be the way. They draw him to his old associates, and holding secret intercourse with them, breed and multiply in him. Very true. At length they seize upon the citadel of the young man's soul, which they perceive to be void of all accomplishments and fair pursuits and true words, 
which make their abode in the minds of men who are dear to the gods, and are their best guardians and sentinels. None better. False and boastful conceits and phrases mount upwards and take their place. They are certain to do so. And so the young man returns into the country of the lotus-eaters, and takes up his dwelling there in the face of all men, and if any help be sent by his friends to the oligarchical part of him, the aforesaid vain conceits shut the gate of the king's fastness, and they will neither allow the embassy itself to enter, nor if private advisers offer the fatherly counsel of the aged, will they listen to them or receive them. There is a battle, and they gain the day, and then modesty, which they call silliness, is ignominiously thrust into exile by them, and temperance, which they nickname unmanliness, is trampled in the mire and cast forth. They persuade men that moderation and orderly expenditure are vulgarity and meanness, and so, by the help of a rabble of evil appetites, they drive them beyond the border. Yes, with a will. And when they have emptied and swept clean the soul of him who is now in their power, and who is being initiated by them in great mysteries, the next thing is to bring back to their house insolence and anarchy and waste and impudence in bright array, having garlands on their heads, and a great company with them, hymning their praises and calling them by sweet names, insolence they term breeding, and anarchy liberty, and waste magnificence, and impudence courage. And so the young man passes out of his original nature, which was trained in the school of necessity, into the freedom and libertinism of useless and unnecessary pleasures. Yes, he said, the change in him is visible enough. After this he lives on, spending his money and labour and time on unnecessary pleasures quite as much as on necessary ones. But if he be fortunate, and is not too much disordered in his wits, when years have elapsed and the heyday of passion is over, supposing that he then readmits into the city some part of the exiled virtues, and does not wholly give himself up to their successors, in that case he balances his pleasures, and lives in a sort of equilibrium, putting the government of himself into the hands of the one which comes first and wins the turn. And when he has had enough of that, then into the hands of another. He despises none of them, but encourages them all equally. Very true, he said. Neither does he receive or let pass into the fortress any true word of advice. If any one says to him that some pleasures are the satisfactions of good and noble desires, and others of evil desires, and that he ought to use and honour some, and chastise and master the others, whenever this is repeated to him, he shakes his head, and says that they are all alike, and that one is as good as another. Yes, he said, that is the way with him. Yes, I said, he lives from day to day, indulging the appetite of the hour, and sometimes he is lapped in drink and strains of the flute. Then he becomes a water-drinker, and tries to get thin. Then he takes a turn at gymnastics, sometimes idling and neglecting everything, then once more living the life of a philosopher. Often he is busy with politics, and starts to his feet, and says and does whatever comes into his head. And, if he is emulous of any one who is a warrior, off he is in that direction, or of men of business once more in that. His life has neither law nor order, and this distracted existence he terms joy and bliss and freedom. And so he goes on. Yes, he replied, he is all liberty and equality. Yes, I said, his life is motley and manifold and an epitome of the lives of many. He answers to the state which we described as fair and spangled. And many a man and many a woman will take him for their pattern, and many a constitution and many an example of manners is contained in him. Just so. Let him then be set over against democracy. He may truly be called the democratic man. Let that be his place, he said. Last of all comes the most beautiful of all, man and state alike, tyranny and the tyrant. These we have now to consider. Quite true, he said. Say then, my friend, in what manner does tyranny arise? That it has a democratic origin is evident. Clearly. And does not tyranny spring from democracy in the same manner as democracy from oligarchy, 
I mean, after a sort. How? The good which oligarchy proposed to itself, and the means by which it was maintained, was excess of wealth. Am I not right? Yes. And the insatiable desire of wealth, and the neglect of all other things for the sake of money-getting, was also the ruin of oligarchy. True. And democracy has her own good, of which the insatiable desire brings her to dissolution. What good? Freedom, I replied, which, as they tell you in a democracy, is the glory of the state, and that therefore in a democracy alone will the free men of nature deign to dwell. Yes, the saying is in everybody's mouth. I was going to observe that the insatiable desire of this, and the neglect of other things, introduces the change in democracy, which occasions a demand for tyranny. How so? When a democracy which is thirsting for freedom has evil cup-bearers presiding over the feast, and has drunk too deeply of the strong wine of freedom, then, unless her rulers are very amenable and give a plentiful draught, she calls them to account and punishes them, and says that they are cursed oligarchs. Yes, he replied, a very common occurrence. Yes, I said and loyal citizens are insultingly termed by her slaves who hug their chains and men of naught. She would have subjects who are like rulers, and rulers who are like subjects. These are men after her own heart, whom she praises and honours both in private and public. Now, in such a state, can liberty have any limit? Certainly not. By degrees the anarchy finds a way into private houses, and ends by getting among the animals and infecting them. How do you mean? I mean that the father grows accustomed to descend to the level of his sons and to fear them, and the son is on a level with his father, he having no respect or reverence for either of his parents, and this is his freedom. And the metic is equal with the citizen, and the citizen with the metic, and the stranger is quite as good as either. Yes, he said, that is the way. And these are not the only evils, I said. There are several lesser ones. In such a state of society, the master fears and flatters his scholars, and the scholars despise their masters and tutors. Young and old are all alike, and the young man is on a level with the old, and is ready to compete with him in word or deed. And old men condescend to the young, and are full of pleasantry and gaiety. They are loath to be thought morose and authoritative, and therefore they adopt the manners of the young. Quite true, he said. The last extreme of popular liberty is when the slave, bought with money, whether male or female, is just as free as his or her purchaser, nor must I forget to tell of the liberty and equality of the two sexes in relation to each other. Why not, as Aeschylus says, utter the word which rises to our lips? That is what I am doing, I replied and I must add that no one who does not know would believe how much greater is the liberty which the animals who are under the dominion of man have in a democracy than in any other state. For truly the she-dogs, as the proverb says, are as good as their she-mistresses, and the horses and asses have a way of marching along with all the rights and dignities of freemen, and they will run at anybody who comes in their way if he does not leave the road clear for them and all things are just ready to burst with liberty. When I take a country walk, he said, I often experience what you describe. You and I have dreamt the same thing. And above all, I said, and as the result of all, see how sensitive the citizens become. They chafe impatiently at the least touch of authority, and at length, as you know, they cease to care even for the laws, written or unwritten. They will have no one over them. Yes, he said, I know it too well. Such, my friend, I said, is the fair and glorious beginning out of which springs tyranny. Glorious indeed, he said. End of Book 8, Part 3— Book 8, Part 4 of Plato's Republic. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anna Sumum. The Republic by Plato. Translated by Benjamin Jowett. Book 8, Part 4. 
But what is the next step? The ruin of oligarchy is the ruin of democracy. The same disease, magnified and intensified by liberty, overmasters democracy, the truth being that the excessive increase of anything often causes a reaction in the opposite direction, and this is the case not only in the seasons and in vegetable and animal life, but above all in forms of government. True. The excess of liberty, whether in states or individuals, seems only to pass into excess of slavery. Yes, the natural order. And so tyranny naturally arises out of democracy, and the most aggravated form of tyranny and slavery out of the most extreme form of liberty. As we might expect. That, however, was not, as I believe, your question. You rather desired to know what is that disorder which is generated alike in oligarchy and democracy, and is the ruin of both. Just so, he replied. Well, I said, I meant to refer to the class of idle spendthrifts of whom the more courageous are the leaders and the more timid the followers, the same whom we were comparing to drones, some stingless and others having stings. A very just comparison. These two classes are the plagues of every city in which they are generated, being what phlegm and bile are to the body, and the good physician and lawgiver of the state ought, like the wise bee-master, to keep them at a distance and prevent, if possible, their ever coming in and if they have anyhow found a way in, then he should have them and their cells cut out as speedily as possible. Yes, by all means, he said. Then, in order that we may see clearly what we are doing, let us imagine democracy to be divided, as indeed it is, into three classes. For in the first place, freedom creates rather more drones in the democratic than there were in the oligarchical state. That is true and in the democracy they are certainly more intensified. How so? Because in the oligarchical state they are disqualified and driven from office, and therefore they cannot train or gather strength, whereas in a democracy they are almost the entire ruling power, and while the keener sort speak and act, the rest keep buzzing about the beamer and do not suffer a word to be said on the other side, hence in democracies almost everything is managed by the drones. Very true, he said. Then there is another class which is always being severed from the mass. What is that? They are the orderly class, which in a nation of traders is sure to be the richest. Naturally so. They are the most squeezable persons, and yield the largest amount of honey to the drones. Why, he said, there is little to be squeezed out of people who have little. And this is called the wealthy class, and the drones feed upon them. That is pretty much the case, he said. The people are a third class, consisting of those who work with their own hands. They are not politicians, and have not much to live upon. This, when assembled, is the largest and most powerful class in a democracy. True, he said. But then the multitude is seldom willing to congregate unless they get a little honey. And do they not share, I said. Do not their leaders deprive the rich of their estates and distribute them among the people, at the same time taking care to reserve the larger part for themselves? Why, yes, he said, to that extent the people do share. And the persons whose property is taken from them are compelled to defend themselves before the people as best they can. What else can they do? And then, although they may have no desire of change, the others charge them with plotting against the people and being friends of oligarchy. True. And the end is that when they see the people not of their own accord but through ignorance and because they are deceived by informers, seeking to do them wrong, then at last they are forced to become oligarchs in reality. They do not wish to be, but the sting of the drones torments them and breeds revolution in them. That is exactly the truth. Then come impeachments and judgments and trials of one another. True. The people have always some champion whom they set over them and nurse into greatness. Yes, that is their way. This and no other is the root from which a tyrant springs. When he first appears above ground, he is a protector. Yes, that is quite clear. How, then, does a protector begin to change into a tyrant? Clearly when he does what the man is said to do in the tale of the Arcadian temple of Lycaean Zeus. What tale? 
the tale is that he who has tasted the entrails of a single human victim, minced up with the entrails of other victims, is destined to become a wolf. Did you never hear it? Oh, yes. And the protector of the people is like him. Having a mob entirely at his disposal, he is not restrained from shedding the blood of kinsmen. By the favourite method of false accusation, he brings them into court and murders them making the life of man to disappear, and with unholy tongue and lips tasting the blood of his fellow-citizens. Some he kills, and others he banishes, at the same time hinting at the abolition of deaths and partition of lands. And after this, what will be his destiny? Must he not either perish at the hands of his enemies, or from being a man become a wolf, that is, a tyrant? Inevitably. This, I said, is he who begins to make a party against the rich. The same. After a while he is driven out, but comes back, in spite of his enemies, a tyrant full-grown. That is clear. And if they are unable to expel him, or to get him condemned to death by a public accusation, they conspire to assassinate him. Yes, he said, that is their usual way. Then comes the famous request for a bodyguard, which is the device of all those who have got thus far in their tyrannical career. Let not the people's friend, as they say, be lost to them. Exactly. The people readily assent. All their fears are for him. They have none for themselves. Very true. And when a man who is wealthy, and is also accused of being an enemy of the people, sees this, then, my friend, as the oracle said to Croesus, By pebbly Hermes shore he flees and rests not, and is not ashamed to be a coward. And quite right, too, said he for if he were, he would never be ashamed again. But if he is caught, he dies. Of course. And he, the protector of whom we spoke, is to be seen not larding the plain with its bulk, but himself the overthrower of many, standing up in the chariot of state with the reins in his hand, no longer protector, but tyrant absolute. No doubt, he said. And now let us consider the happiness of the man, and also of the state in which a creature like him is generated. Yes, he said, let us consider that. At first, in the early days of his power, he is full of smiles, and he salutes every one whom he meets. He to be called a tyrant, who is making promises in public and also in private, liberating debtors, and distributing land to the people and his followers, and wanting to be so kind and good to every one. Of course, he said. But when he has disposed of foreign enemies by conquest or treaty, and there is nothing to fear from them, then he is always stirring up some war or other, in order that the people may require a leader. To be sure. Has he not also another object, which is that they may be impoverished by payment of taxes, and thus compelled to devote themselves to their daily wants, and therefore less likely to conspire against him? Clearly. And if any of them are suspected by him of having notions of freedom— and of resistance to his authority, he will have a good pretext for destroying them by placing them at the mercy of the enemy, and for all these reasons the tyrant must be always getting up a war. He must. Now he begins to grow unpopular. A necessary result. Then some of those who joined in setting him up, and who are in power, speak their minds to him and to one another, and the more courageous of them cast in his teeth what is being done. Yes, that may be expected. And the tyrant, if he means to rule, must get rid of them. He cannot stop while he has a friend or an enemy who is good for anything. He cannot. And therefore he must look about him and see who is valiant, who is high-minded, who is wise, who is wealthy. Happy man, he is the enemy of them all, and must seek occasion against them, whether he will or no, until he has made a purgation of the state. Yes, he said, and a rare purgation. Yes, I said not the sort of purgation which the physicians make of the body, for they take away the worse and leave the better part, but he does the reverse. If he is to rule, I suppose that he cannot help himself. What a blessed alternative, I said, to be compelled to dwell only with the many bad, and to be by them hated, or not to live at all. Yes, that is the alternative. And the more detestable his actions are to the citizens, the more satellites and the greater devotion in them will he require. Certainly. And who are the devoted band, and where will he procure them? 
They will flock to him, he said, of their own accord, if he pays them. By the dog, I said, here are more drones, of every sort and from every land. Yes, he said, there are. But will he not desire to get them on the spot? How do you mean? He will rob the citizens of their slaves. He will then set them free and enroll them in his bodyguard. To be sure, he said, and he will be able to trust them best of all. What a blessed creature, I said, must this tyrant be. He has put to death the others, and has these for his trusted friends. Yes, he said, they are quite of his sort. Yes, I said, and these are the new citizens whom he has called into existence, who admire him and are his companions, while the good hate and avoid him. Of course. Verily, then, tragedy is a wise thing, and Euripides a great tragedian. Why so? Why, because he is the author of the pregnant saying, Tyrants are wise by living with the wise, and he clearly meant to say that they are the wise whom the tyrant makes his companions. Yes, he said, and he also praises tyranny as godlike, and many other things of the same kind are said by him and by the other poets. And therefore, I said, the tragic poems, being wise men, will forgive us and any others who live after our manner, if we do not receive them into our state, because they are the eulogists of tyranny. Yes, he said, those who have the wit will doubtless forgive us. But they will continue to go to other cities and attract mobs, and hire voices fair and loud and persuasive, and draw the cities over to tyrannies and democracies. Very true. Moreover, they are paid for this and receive honour, the greatest honour, as might be expected, from tyrants, and the next greatest from democracies. But the higher they ascend our constitution hill, the more their reputation fails, and seems unable from shortness of breath to proceed further. True. But we are wandering from the subject. Let us therefore return and inquire how the tyrant will maintain that fair and numerous and various and ever-changing army of his. If, he said, there are sacred treasures in the city, he will confiscate and spend them, and in so far as the fortunes of attainted persons may suffice, he will be able to diminish the taxes which he would otherwise have to impose upon the people. And when these fail? Why, clearly, he said, then he and his boon companions, whether male or female, will be maintained out of his father's estate. You mean to say that the people, from whom he has derived his being, will maintain him and his companions. Yes, he said, they cannot help themselves. But what if the people fly into a passion, and aver that a grown-up son ought not to be supported by his father, but that the father should be supported by the son? The father did not bring him into being, or settle him in life, in order that when his son became a man, he should himself be the servant of his own servants, and should support him and his rabble of slaves and companions but that his son should protect him, and that by his help he might be emancipated from the government of the rich and aristocratic, as they are termed. And so he bids him and his companions depart, just as any other father might drive out of the house a riotous son and his undesirable associates. By heaven, he said, then the parent will discover what a monster he has been fostering in his bosom, and when he wants to drive him out, he will find that he is weak and his son strong. Why, you do not mean to say that the tyrant will use violence. What, beat his father if he opposes him? Yes, he will, having first disarmed him. Then he is a parasite, and a cruel guardian of an aged parent, and this is real tyranny, about which there can be no longer a mistake. As the saying is, the people who would escape this smoke, which is the slavery of freemen, has fallen into the fire which the tyranny of slaves. Thus liberty, getting out of all order and reason, passes into the harshest and bitterest form of slavery. True, he said. Very well, and may we not rightly say that we have sufficiently discussed the nature of tyranny, and the manner of transition from democracy to tyranny. Yes, quite enough, he said. End of Book Eight Book Nine, Part One of Plato's Republic. 
This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Geoffrey Edwards. The Republic by Plato. Translated by Benjamin Jowett. Book 9, Part 1. Last of all comes the tyrannical man, about whom we have once more to ask, how is he formed out of the democratical? And how does he live, in happiness or in misery? Yes, he said, he is the only one remaining. There is, however, I said, a previous question, which remains unanswered. What question? I do not think that we have adequately determined the nature and number of the appetites, and until this is accomplished, the inquiry will always be confused. Well, he said, it is not too late to supply the omission. Very true, I said, and observe the point which I want to understand. Certain of the unnecessary pleasures and appetites I conceive to be unlawful. Everyone appears to have them, but in some persons they are controlled by the laws and by reason, and the better desires prevail over them. Either they are wholly banished, or they become few and weak, while in the case of others they are stronger, and there are more of them. Which appetites do you mean? I mean those which are awake when the reasoning and human and ruling power is asleep. Then the wild beast within us, gorged with meat or drink, starts up, and having shaken off sleep, goes forth to satisfy his desires, and there is no conceivable folly or crime, not excepting incest, or any other unnatural union, or parricide, or the eating of forbidden food, which, at such a time, when he has parted company with all shame and sense, a man may not be ready to commit. Most true, he said. But when a man's pulse is healthy and temperate, and when before going to sleep he has awakened his rational powers, and fed them on noble thoughts and inquiries, collecting himself in meditation, after having first indulged his appetites neither too much nor too little, but just enough to lay them to sleep, and prevent them and their enjoyments and pains from interfering with the higher principle, which he leaves in the solitude of pure abstraction, free to contemplate and aspire to the knowledge of the unknown, whether in past, present, or future, when again he has allayed the passionate element, if he has a quarrel against any one, I say, when, after pacifying the two irrational principles, he rouses up the third, which is reason, before he takes his rest, then, as you know, he attains truth most nearly, and is least likely to be the sport of fantastic and lawless visions. I quite agree. In saying this, I have been running into a digression, but the point which I desire to note is that in all of us, even in good men, there is a lawless, wild beast nature, which peers out in sleep. Pray, consider whether I am right, and you agree with me. Yes, I agree. And now remember the character which we attributed to the democratic man. He was supposed from his youth upwards to have been trained under a miserly parent, who encouraged the saving appetites in him, but discountenanced the unnecessary, which aim only at amusement and ornament? True. And then he got into the company of a more refined, licentious sort of people, and taking to all their wanton ways, rushed into the opposite extreme for an abhorrence of his father's meanness. At last, being a better man than his corruptors, he was drawn in both directions, until he halted midway, and led a life not of vulgar and slavish passion, but of what he deemed moderate indulgence in various pleasures. After this manner the democrat was generated out of the oligarch? Yes, he said, that was our view of him, and is so still. And now, I said, years will have passed away, and you must conceive this man, such as he is, to have a son, who is brought up in his father's principles. I can imagine him. Then you must further imagine the same thing to happen to the son, which has already happened to the father. He is drawn into a perfectly lawless life, which by his seducers is termed perfect liberty, and his father and friends take part with his moderate desires, and the opposite party assist the opposite ones. As soon as these dire magicians and tyrant-makers find that they are losing their hold on him, they contrive to implant in him a master passion, 
to be lord over his idle and spendthrift lusts, a sort of monstrous winged drone. That is the only image which will adequately describe him. Yes, he said, that is the only adequate image of him. And when his other lusts, amid clouds of incense and perfumes and garlands and wines, and all the pleasures of a dissolute life, now let loose, come buzzing around him, nourishing to the utmost the sting of desire which they implant in his drone-like nature, then at last this lord of the soul, having madness for the captain of his guard, breaks out into a frenzy, and if he finds in himself any good opinions or appetites in process of formation, and there is in him any sense of shame remaining, to these better principles he puts an end, and casts them forth until he has purged away temperance, and brought in madness to the full. Yes, he said, that is the way in which the tyrannical man is generated. And is not this the reason why of old love has been called a tyrant? I should not wonder. Further, I said, has not a drunken man also the spirit of a tyrant? He has. And do you know that a man who is deranged and not right in his mind will fancy that he is able to rule, not only over men, but also over the gods? That he will. And the tyrannical man, in the true sense of the word, comes into being when, either under the influence of nature, or habit, or both, he becomes drunken, lustful, passionate? Oh, my friend, is not that so? Assuredly. Such is the man, and such is his origin. And next, how does he live? Suppose, as people facetiously say, you were to tell me. I imagine, I said, at the next step in his progress, that there will be feasts, and carousals, and revelings, and courtesans, and all that sort of thing. Love is the lord of the house within him, and orders all the concerns of his soul. That is certain. Yes, and every day and every night desires grow up many and formidable, and their demands are many. They are indeed, he said. His revenues, if he has any, are soon spent. True. Then comes debt and the cutting down of his property. Of course. When he has nothing left, must not his desires, crowding in the nest like young ravens, be crying aloud for food, and he, goaded on by them, and especially by love himself, who is in a manner the captain of them, is in a frenzy, and would fain discover whom he can defraud or despoil of his property, in order that he may gratify them? Yes, that is sure to be the case. He must have money, no matter how, if he is to escape horrid pains and pangs. He must. And, as in himself there was a succession of pleasures, and the new got the better of the old and took away their rights, so he, being younger, will claim to have more than his father and his mother, and if he has spent his own share of the property, he will take a slice of theirs. No doubt he will. And if his parents will not give way, then he will try first of all to cheat and deceive them. Very true. And if he fails, then he will use force and plunder them. Yes, probably. And if the old man and woman fight for their own, what then, my friend? Will the creature feel any compunction at tyrannizing over them? Nay, he said, I should not feel at all comfortable about his parents. But, oh heavens, Adimantus, on account of some new-fangled love of a harlot who is anything but a necessary connection, can you believe that he would strike the mother who is his ancient friend and necessary to his very existence, and would place her under the authority of the other when she is brought under the same roof with her, or that, under like circumstances, he would do the same to his withered old father, first and most indispensable of friends, for the sake of some newly found blooming youth who is the reverse of indispensable? Yes, indeed, he said, I believe that he would. Truly, then, I said, a tyrannical son is a blessing to his father and mother. He is indeed, he replied. He first takes their property, and when that fails, and pleasures are beginning to swarm in the hive of his soul, then he breaks into a house, or steals the garments of some knightly wayfarer. Next he proceeds to clear a temple. Meanwhile, the old opinions which he had when a child, and which gave judgment about good and evil, are overthrown by those others which have just been emancipated, 
and are now the bodyguard of love and share his empire. These, in his democratic days, when he was still subject to the laws and to his father, were only let loose in the dreams of sleep. But now that he is under the dominion of love, he becomes always and in waking reality what he was then very rarely and in a dream only. He will commit the foulest murder, or eat forbidden food, or be guilty of any other horrid act. Love is his tyrant, and lives lordly in him and lawlessly, and being himself a king, leads him on, as a tyrant leads a state, to the performance of any reckless deed by which he can maintain himself and the rabble of his associates, whether those whom evil communicates have brought in from without, or those whom he himself has allowed to break loose within him by reason of a similar evil nature in himself. Have we not here a picture of his way of life? Yes, indeed, he said. And if there are only a few of them in the state, and the rest of the people are well disposed, they go away and become the bodyguard or mercenary soldiers of some other tyrant who may probably want them for a war? And if there is no war, they stay at home and do many little pieces of mischief in the city? What sort of mischief? For example, they are thieves, burglars, cut-purses, foot-pads, robbers of temples, man-stealers of the community, or if they are able to speak, they turn informers, and bear false witness, and take bribes. A small catalogue of evils, even if the perpetrators of them are few in number. Yes, I said, but small and great are comparative terms, and all these things, in the misery and evil which they inflict upon a state, do not come within a thousand miles of the tyrant, when this noxious class and their followers grow numerous and become conscious of their strength, assisted by the infatuation of the people, they choose from among themselves the one who has most of the tyrant in his own soul, and him they create their tyrant. Yes, he said, and he will be the most fit to be a tyrant. If the people yield, well and good, but if they resist him, as he began by beating his own father and mother, so now, if he has the power, he beats them and will keep his dear old fatherland or motherland, as the Cretans say, in subjection to his young retainers, whom he has introduced to be their rulers and masters. This is the end of his passions and desires. Exactly. When such men are only private individuals, and before they get power, this is their character. They associate entirely with their own flatterers or ready tools, or, if they want anything from anybody, they in their turn are equally ready to bow down before them, they profess every sort of affection for them, but when they have gained their point, they know them no more. Yes, truly. They are always either the masters or servants, and never the friends of anybody. The tyrant never tastes of true freedom or friendship. Certainly not. And may not we rightly call such men treacherous? No question. Also, they are utterly unjust. If we were right in our notion of justice... Yes, he said and we were perfectly right. Let us then sum up in a word, I said, the character of the worst man. He is the waking reality of what we dreamed. Most true. And this is he who, being by nature most of a tyrant, bears rule, and the longer he lives, the more of a tyrant he becomes. That is certain, said Glaucon, taking his turn to answer. And will not he, who has been shown to be the wickedest, be also the most miserable? and he who has tyrannized longest and most, most continually and truly miserable, although this may not be the opinion of men in general? Yes, he said, inevitably. And must not the tyrannical man be like the tyrannical state, and the democratical man like the democratical state, and the same of the others? Certainly. And as state is to state in virtue and happiness, so is man in relation to man? To be sure. Then comparing our original city, which was under a king, and the city which is under a tyrant, how do they stand as to virtue? They are the opposite extremes, he said, for one is the very best, and the other is the very worst. There can be no mistake, I said, as to which is which, and therefore I will at once inquire whether you would arrive at a similar decision about their relative happiness and misery. And here we must not allow ourselves to be panic-stricken at the apparition of the tyrant, who is only a unit, and may perhaps have a few retainers about him. But let us go as we ought into every corner of the city, and look all about, and then we will give our opinion. A fair invitation, he replied, and I see, as every one must, that a tyranny is the wretchedest form of government, 
and the rule of a king the happiest. And in estimating the men too, may I not fairly make a like request, that I should have a judge whose mind can enter into and see through human nature? He must not be like a child, who looks at the outside and is dazzled at the pompous aspect which the tyrannical nature assumes to the beholder, but let him be one who has a clear insight. May I suppose that the judgment is given in the hearing of us all by one who is able to judge, and has dwelt in the same place with him, and been present at his daily life, and known him in his family relations, where he may be seen stripped of his tragedy attire, and again in the hour of public danger, he shall tell us about the happiness and misery of the tyrant, when compared with other men? That again, he said, is a very fair proposal. Shall I assume that we ourselves are able and experienced judges, and have before now met with such a person? We shall then have someone who will answer our inquiries. By all means. Let me ask you not to forget the parallel of the individual and the state. Bearing this in mind, and glancing in turn from one to the other of them, will you tell me their respective conditions? What do you mean? he asked. Beginning with the state, I replied. Would you say that a city which is governed by a tyrant is free or enslaved? No city, he said, can be more completely enslaved. And yet, as you see, there are free men as well as masters in such a state. Yes, he said, I see that there are, a few, but the people, speaking generally, and the best of them, are miserably degraded and enslaved. Then if the man is like the state, I said, must not the same rule prevail? His soul is full of meanness and vulgarity. The best elements in him are enslaved, and there is a small ruling part, which is also the worst and maddest. Inevitably. And would you say that the soul of such a one is the soul of a free man, or of a slave? He has the soul of a slave, in my opinion. And the state which is enslaved under a tyrant is utterly incapable of acting voluntarily? Utterly incapable. And also the soul which is under a tyrant... I am speaking of the soul taken as a whole, is least capable of doing what she desires. There is a gadfly which goads her, and she is full of trouble and remorse? Certainly. And is the city which is under a tyrant rich or poor? Poor. And the tyrannical soul must be always poor and insatiable? True. And must not such a state and such a man be always full of fear? Yes, indeed. Is there any state in which you will find more of lamentation and sorrow, and groaning and pain? Certainly not. And is there any man in whom you will find more of this sort of misery than in the tyrannical man, who is in a fury of passions and desires? Impossible. Reflecting upon these and similar evils, you held the tyrannical state to be the most miserable of states? And I was right, he said. Certainly, I said. And when you see the same evils in the tyrannical man, what do you say of him? I say that he is by far the most miserable of all men. There, I said, I think that you are beginning to go wrong. What do you mean? I do not think that he has as yet reached the utmost extreme of misery. Then who is more miserable? One of whom I am about to speak. Who is that? He who is of a tyrannical nature, and instead of leading a private life, has been cursed with the further misfortune of being a public tyrant. From what has been said, I gather that you are right. Yes, I replied, but in this high argument you should be a little more certain, and should not conjecture only, for of all questions, this respecting good and evil is the greatest. Very true, he said. End of Book 9, Part 1 Recording by Jeffrey Edwards Book 9, Part 2 of Plato's Republic This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Geoffrey Edwards The Republic by Plato Translated by Benjamin Jowett Book 9, Part 2 
Let me then offer you an illustration which may, I think, throw a light upon this subject. What is your illustration? The case of rich individuals in cities who possess many slaves. From them you may form an idea of the tyrant's condition, for they both have slaves. The only difference is that he has more slaves. Yes, that is the difference. You know that they live securely and have nothing to apprehend from their servants? What should they fear? Nothing. But do you observe the reason of this? Yes. The reason is that the whole city is leagued together for the protection of each individual. Very true, I said. But imagine one of these owners, the master, say, of some fifty slaves, together with his family and property and slaves. "'carried off by a god into the wilderness, "'where there are no free men to help him. "'Will he not be in an agony of fear, "'lest he and his wife and children "'should be put to death by his slaves?' "'Yes,' he said. "'He will be in the utmost fear. "'The time has arrived "'when he will be compelled to flatter "'divers of his slaves, "'and make many promises to them "'of freedom and other things, "'much against his will. "'He will have to cajole his own servants.' "'Yes,' he said, that will be the only way of saving himself. And suppose the same God, who carried him away to surround him with neighbors who will not suffer one man to be the master of another, and who, if they could catch the offender, would take his life. His case will be still worse if you suppose him to be everywhere surrounded and watched by enemies. And is not this the sort of prison in which the tyrant will be bound? He, who being by nature such as we have described, is full of all sorts of fears and lusts. His soul is dainty and greedy, and yet alone, of all men in the city, he is never allowed to go on a journey, or to see the things which other free men desire to see. But he lives in his hole, like a woman hidden in the house, and is jealous of any other citizen who goes into foreign parts and sees anything of interest. Very true, he said. And amid evils such as these, will not he who is ill-governed in his own person, the tyrannical man, I mean, whom you just now decided to be the most miserable of all, will not he be yet more miserable when, instead of leaving a private life, he is constrained by fortune to be a public tyrant? He has to be master of others when he is not master of himself. He is like a diseased or paralytic man who is compelled to pass his life, not in retirement, but fighting and combating with other men. Yes, he said. The similitude is most exact. Is not his case utterly miserable, and does not the actual tyrant lead a worse life than he whose life you determine to be the worst? Certainly. He who is the real tyrant, whatever men may think, is the real slave, and is obliged to practice the greatest adulation and servility, and to be the flatterer of the vilest of mankind. He has desires which he is utterly unable to satisfy, and has more wants than any one, and is truly poor, if you know how to inspect the whole soul of him. All his life long he is beset with fear, and is full of convulsions and distractions, even as the state which he resembles, and surely the resemblance holds? Very true, he said. Moreover, as we were saying, before he grows worse from having power, he becomes, and is of necessity, more jealous more faithless, more unjust, more friendless, more impious, than he was at first. He is the purveyor and cherisher of every sort of vice, and the consequence is that he is supremely miserable, and that he makes everybody else as miserable as himself. No man of any sense will dispute your words. Come, then, I said, and as the general umpire in theatrical contests proclaim the result— do you also decide who, in your opinion, is the first in the scale of happiness, and who second, and in what order the others follow? There are five of them in all. They are the royal, timocratical, oligarchical, democratical, tyrannical. The decision will be easily given, he replied. They shall be choruses coming on the stage, and I must judge them in the order in which they enter, by the criterion of virtue and vice, happiness and misery. Need we hire a herald? Or shall I announce that the son of Ariston, the best, has decided that the best and justest is also the happiest, 
and that this is he who is the most royal man and king over himself, and that the worst and most unjust man is also the most miserable, and that this is he who, being the greatest tyrant of himself, is also the greatest tyrant of his state? Make the proclamation yourself, he said. And shall I add, whether seen or unseen by gods and men? Let the words be added. Then this, I said, will be our first proof, and there is another which may also have some weight. What is that? The second proof is derived from the nature of the soul, seeing that the individual soul, like the state, has been divided by us into three principles, the division may, I think, furnish a new demonstration. Of what nature? It seems to me that to these three principles three pleasures correspond, also three desires and governing powers. How do you mean? he said. There is one principle with which, as we were saying, a man learns, another with which he is angry, the third, having many forms, has no special name, but is denoted by the general term appetitive, from the extraordinary strength and vehemence of the desires of eating and drinking, and the other sensual appetites, which are the main elements of it, also money-loving, because such desires are generally satisfied by the help of money. That is true, he said. If we were to say that the loves and pleasures of this third part were concerned with gain, we should then be able to fall back on a single notion, and might truly and intelligibly describe this part of the soul as loving gain or money. I agree with you. Again, is not the passionate element wholly set on ruling and conquering and getting fame? True. Suppose we call it the contentious or ambitious, would the term be suitable? Extremely suitable. On the other hand, everyone sees that the principle of knowledge is wholly directed to the truth, and cares less than either of the others for gain or fame. Far less. Lover of wisdom, lover of knowledge, are titles which we may fitly apply to that part of the soul? Certainly. One principle prevails in the souls of one class of men, another in others, as may happen? Yes. Then we may begin by assuming that there are three classes of men, lovers of wisdom, lovers of honor, lovers of gain? Exactly. And there are three kinds of pleasure, which are their several objects? Very true. Now, if you examine the three classes of men, and ask of them in turn which of their lives is pleasantest, each will be found praising his own, and depreciating that of others. The money-maker will contrast the vanity of honor, or of learning, if they bring no money, with the solid advantages of gold and silver? True, he said. And the lover of honor, what will be his opinion? Will he not think that the pleasure of riches is vulgar, while the pleasure of learning, if it brings no distinction, is all smoke and nonsense to him? Very true. And are we to suppose, I said, that the philosopher sets any value on other pleasures in comparison with the pleasure of knowing the truth, and in that pursuit abiding, ever learning, not so far indeed from the heaven of pleasure? Does he not call the other pleasures necessary, under the idea that if there were no necessity for them, he would rather not have them? There can be no doubt of that, he replied. Since, then, the pleasures of each class and the life of each are in dispute, and the question is not which life is more or less honorable, or better or worse, but which is the more pleasant or painless, how shall we know who speaks truly? I cannot myself tell, he said. Well, but what ought to be the criterion? Is any better than experience and wisdom and reason? There cannot be a better, he said. Then, I said, reflect, of the three individuals, which has the greatest experience of all the pleasures which we enumerated? Has the lover of gain, in learning the nature of essential truth, greater experience of the pleasure of knowledge than the philosopher has of the pleasure of gain? The philosopher, he replied, has greatly the advantage, for he has of necessity always known the taste of the other pleasures from his childhood upwards. But the lover of gain, in all his experience, has not of necessity tasted, or, 
I should rather say, even had he desired, could hardly have tasted, the sweetness of learning and knowing truth. Then the lover of wisdom has a great advantage over the lover of gain, for he has a double experience? Yes, very great. Again, has he greater experience of the pleasures of honor, or the lover of honor of the pleasures of wisdom? Nay, he said, all three are honored in proportion as they attain their object, for the rich man, and the brave man, and the wise men alike have their crowd of admirers, and as they all receive honor, they all have experience of the pleasures of honor. But the delight which is to be found in the knowledge of true being is known to the philosopher only. His experience, then, will enable him to judge better than any one? Far better. And he is the only one who has wisdom as well as experience? Certainly. Further, the very faculty, which is the instrument of judgment, is not possessed by the covetous or ambitious man, but only by the philosopher? What faculty? Reason, with whom, as we were saying, the decision ought to rest. Yes. And reasoning is peculiarly his instrument? Certainly. If wealth and gain were the criterion, then the praise or blame of the lover of gain would certainly be the most trustworthy? Assuredly. Or if honor, or victory, or courage, in that case the judgment of the ambitious or pugnacious would be the truest? Clearly. But since experience and wisdom and reason are the judges? The only inference possible, he replied, is that pleasures which are approved by the lover of wisdom and reason are the truest. And so we arrive at the result that the pleasure of the intelligent part of the soul is the pleasantest of the three, and that he of us in whom this is the ruling principle has the pleasantest life. Unquestionably, he said, the wise man speaks with authority when he approves of his own life. And what does the judge affirm to be the life which is next? and the pleasure which is next. Clearly that of the soldier and lover of honor, who is nearer to himself than the money-maker. Last comes the lover of gain. Very true, he said. Twice in succession, then, has the just man overthrown the unjust in this conflict, and now comes the third trial, which is dedicated to Olympian Zeus, the saviour. A sage whispers in my ear that no pleasure except that of the wise is quite true and pure. All others are a shadow only, and surely this will prove the greatest and most decisive of false? Yes, the greatest. But will you explain yourself? I will work out the subject, and you shall answer my questions. Proceed. Say, then, is not pleasure opposite to pain? True. And there is a neutral state which is neither pleasure nor pain? There is. A state which is intermediate, and a sort of repose of the soul about either, that is what you mean? Yes. You remember what people say when they are sick? What do they say? That after all, nothing is pleasanter than health, but then they never knew this to be the greatest of pleasures until they were ill. Yes, I know, he said. And when persons are suffering from acute pain, you must have heard them say that there is nothing pleasanter than to get rid of their pain? I have. And there are many other cases of suffering in which the mere rest and cessation of pain, and not any positive enjoyment, is extolled by them as the greatest pleasure? Yes, he said, at the time they are pleased and well content to be at rest. Again, when pleasure ceases, that sort of rest or cessation will be painful? Doubtless, he said. Then the intermediate state of rest will be pleasure and will also be pain? So it would seem. But can that which is neither become both? I should say not. And both pleasure and pain are motions of the soul, are they not? Yes. But that which is neither was just now shown to be rest and not motion, and in a mean between them? Yes. How, then, can we be right in supposing that the absence of pain is pleasure, or that the absence of pleasure is pain? 
Impossible. This, then, is an appearance only, and not a reality. That is to say, the rest is pleasure at the moment and in comparison of what is painful, and painful in comparison of what is pleasant. But all these representations, when tried by the test of true pleasure, are not real, but a sort of imposition? That is the inference. Look at the other class of pleasures, which have no antecedent pains, and you will no longer suppose, as you perhaps may at present, that pleasure is only the cessation of pain, or pain of pleasure. What are they, he said, and where shall I find them? There are many of them. Take as an example the pleasures of smell, which are very great and have no antecedent pains. They come in a moment, and when they depart, leave no pain behind them. Most true, he said. Let us not, then, be induced to believe that pure pleasure is the cessation of pain, or pain of pleasure. No. Still, the more numerous and violent pleasures which reach the soul through the body are generally of this sort. They are reliefs of pain. That is true. And the anticipations of future pleasures and pains are of a like nature? Yes. Shall I give you an illustration of them? Let me hear. You would allow, I said, that there is in nature an upper and lower and middle region? I should. And if a person were to go from the lower to the middle region, would he not imagine that he is going up? And he who is standing in the middle and sees whence he has come would imagine that he is already in the upper region, if he has never seen the true upper world? To be sure, he said. How can he think otherwise? But if we were taken back again, he would imagine, and truly imagine, that he was descending? No doubt. All that would arise out of his ignorance of the true upper and middle and lower regions? Yes. End of Book 9, Part 2 Recording by Geoffrey Edwards Book 9, Part 3 of Plato's Republic This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Geoffrey Edwards The Republic by Plato Translated by Benjamin Jowett Book 9, Part 3 Then can you wonder that persons who are inexperienced in the truth as they have wrong ideas about many other things, should also have wrong ideas about pleasure and pain, and the intermediate state, so that when they are only being drawn towards the painful, they feel pain, and think the pain which they experience to be real, and in like manner, when drawn away from pain to the neutral or intermediate state, they firmly believe that they have reached the goal of satiety and pleasure. They, not knowing pleasure, err in contrasting pain with the absence of pain, which is like contrasting black with grey, instead of white. Can you wonder, I say, at this? No, indeed. I should be much more disposed to wonder at the opposite. Look at the matter thus. Hunger, thirst, and the like are inanitions of the bodily state? Yes. And ignorance and folly are inanitions of the soul? True. And food and wisdom are the corresponding satisfactions of either? Certainly. And is the satisfaction derived from that which has less, or from that which has more existence, the truer? Clearly from that which has more. What classes of things have a greater share of pure existence in your judgment? Those of which food and drink and condiments and all kinds of sustenance are examples? or the class which contains true opinion, and knowledge, and mind, and all the different kinds of virtue? Put the question in this way. Which has a more pure being? That which is concerned with the invariable, the immortal, and the true, and is of such a nature, and is found in such natures? Or that which is concerned with and bound in the variable and mortal, and is itself variable and mortal? Far purer, he replied, is the being of that which is concerned with the invariable. 
And does the essence of the invariable partake of knowledge in the same degree as of essence? Yes, of knowledge in the same degree. And of truth in the same degree? Yes. And, conversely, that which has less of truth will also have less of essence? Necessarily. Then, in general, those kinds of things which are in the service of the body have less of truth and essence than those which are in the service of the soul? Far less. And has not the body itself less of truth and essence than the soul? Yes. What is filled with more real existence, and actually has a more real existence, is more really filled than that which is filled with less real existence and is less real? Of course. And if there be a pleasure in being filled with that which is according to nature, that which is more really filled with more real being will more really and truly enjoy true pleasure, whereas that which participates in less real being will be less truly and surely satisfied, and will participate in an illusory and less real pleasure? Unquestionably. Those, then, who know not wisdom and virtue, and are always busy with gluttony and sensuality, go down and up again as far as the mean, and in this region they move at random throughout life, but they never pass into the true upper world, thither they never look, nor do they ever find their way, neither are they truly filled with true being, nor do they taste of pure and abiding pleasure. Like cattle, with their eyes always looking down, and their heads stooping to the earth, that is, to the dining-table, they fatten and feed and breed, and in their excessive love of these delights they kick and butt at one another with horns and hoofs, which are made of iron, and they kill one another by reason of their insatiable lust, for they fill themselves with that which is not substantial, and the part of themselves which they fill is also unsubstantial and incontinent. Verily, Socrates, said Glaucon, you describe the life of the many like an oracle. Their pleasures are mixed with pains. How can they be otherwise? For they are mere shadows and pictures of the true, and are colored by contrast, which exaggerates both light and shade, and so they implant in the minds of fools insane desires of themselves, and they are fought about, as Stesichorus says, that the Greeks fought about the shadow of Helen at Troy, in ignorance of the truth. Something of that sort must inevitably happen. And must not the like happen with the spirited or passionate element of the soul? Will not the passionate man, who carries his passions into action, be in the like case, whether he is envious and ambitious, or violent and contentious, or angry and discontented, if he be seeking to attain honor and victory in the satisfaction of his anger without reason or sense? Yes, he said, the same will happen with the spirited element also. Then may we not confidently assert that the lovers of money and honor when they seek their pleasures under the guidance and in the company of reason and knowledge, and pursue after and win the pleasures which wisdom shows them, will also have the truest pleasures in the highest degree which is attainable to them, inasmuch as they follow truth, and they will have the pleasures which are natural to them, if that which is best for each one is also most natural to him? Yes, certainly, the best is the most natural. And when the whole soul follows the philosophical principle, and there is no division, the several parts are just, and do each of them their own business, and enjoy severally the best and truest pleasures of which they are capable? Exactly. But when either of the two other principles prevails, it fails in attaining its own pleasure, and compels the rest to pursue after a pleasure which is a shadow only, and which is not their own? True. And the greater the interval which separates them from philosophy and reason, the more strange and elusive will be the pleasure? Yes. And is not that farthest from reason, which is at the greatest distance from law and order? Clearly. And the lustful and tyrannical desires are, as we saw, at the greatest distance? Yes. And the royal and orderly desires are nearest? Yes. Then the tyrant will live at the greatest distance from true or natural pleasure, and the king at the least? Certainly. But if so, the tyrant will live most unpleasantly, and the king most pleasantly? Inevitably. 
Would you know the measure of the interval which separates them? Will you tell me? There appear to be three pleasures, one genuine and two spurious. Now the transgression of the tyrant reaches a point beyond the spurious. He has run away from the region of law and reason, and takes up his abode with certain slave pleasures, which are his satellites, and the measure of his inferiority can only be expressed in a figure. How do you mean? I assume, I said, that the tyrant is in the third place from the oligarch. The democrat was in the middle? Yes. And if there is truce in what is preceded, he will be wedded to an image of pleasure, which is thrice removed, as to truce, from the pleasure of the oligarch? He will. And the oligarch is third from the royal, since we count as one royal and aristocratical? Yes, he is third. Then the tyrant is removed from true pleasure by the space of a number which is three times three? Manifestly. The shadow, then, of tyrannical pleasure, determined by the number of length, will be a plain figure. Certainly. And if you raise the power and make the plane a solid, there is no difficulty in seeing how vast is the interval by which the tyrant is parted from the king? Yes, the arithmetician will easily do the sum. Or, if some person begins at the other end and measures the interval by which the king is parted from the tyrant in truth of pleasure, he will find him, when the multiplication is completed, living seven hundred and twenty-nine times more pleasantly, and the tyrant more painfully by this same interval. What a wonderful calculation! And how enormous is the distance which separates the just from the unjust in regard to pleasure and pain! Yet a true calculation, I said, and a number which nearly concerns human life. If human beings are concerned with days and nights and months and years, 729 nearly equals the number of days and nights in the year. Yes, he said, human life is certainly concerned with them. Then if the good and just man be thus superior in pleasure to the evil and unjust, his superiority will be infinitely greater in propriety of life and in beauty and in virtue? immeasurably greater. Well, I said, and now having arrived at this stage of the argument, we may revert to the words which brought us hither. Was not someone saying that injustice was a gain to the perfectly unjust who was reputed to be just? Yes, that was said. Now then, having demonstrated the power and quality of justice and injustice, let us have a little conversation with him. What shall we say to him? Let us make an image of the soul, that he may have his own words presented before his eyes. Of what sort? An ideal image of the soul, like the composite creations of ancient mythology, such as the Chimera, or Scylla, or Cerberus, and there are many others in which two or more different natures are said to grow into one. There are said to have been such unions... Then do you now model the form of a multitudinous, many-headed monster, having a ring of heads of all manner of beasts, tame and wild, which he is able to generate and metamorphose at will? You suppose marvelous powers in the artist, but, as language is more pliable than wax or any similar substance, let there be such a model as you propose. Suppose now that you make a second form as of a lion, and a third of a man, the second smaller than the third, and the third smaller than the second. That, he said, is an easier task, and I have made them as you say. And now join them, and let the three go into one. That has been accomplished. Next, fashion the outside of them into a single image, as of a man, so that he who is not able to look within and sees only the outer hull may believe the beast to be a single human creature. I have done so, he said. And now, to him who maintains that it is profitable for the human creature to be unjust, and unprofitable to be just, let us reply that, if he be right, it is profitable for this creature to feast the multitudinous monster, and strengthen the lion, and the lion-like qualities, but to starve and weaken the man, who is consequently liable to be dragged about at the mercy of either of the other two, and he is not to attempt to familiarize or harmonize them with one another. He ought rather to suffer them to fight and bite and devour one another. Certainly, he said, 
That is what the approver of injustice says. To him, the supporter of justice makes answer that should he ever so speak and act as to give the man within him in some way or other the most complete mastery over the entire human creature, he should watch over the many-headed monster like a good husbandman, fostering and cultivating the gentile qualities and preventing the wild ones from growing. He should be making the lion-heart his ally, and in common care of them all should be uniting the several parts with one another and with himself. Yes, he said, that is quite what the maintainer of justice say. And so, from every point of view, whether of pleasure, honor, or advantage, the approver of justice is right and speaks the truth, and the disapprover is wrong and false and ignorant? Yes, from every point of view. Come now, and let us gently reason with the unjust, who is not intentionally in error. Sweet sir, we will say to him, what think you of things esteemed noble and ignoble? Is not the noble that which subjects the beast to the man, or rather to the god in man, and the ignoble that which subjects the man to the beast? He can hardly avoid saying yes, can he now? Not if he has any regard for my opinion. But if he agree so far, we may ask him to answer another question. Then how would a man profit if he received gold and silver, on the condition that he was to enslave the noblest part of him to the worst? Who can imagine that a man who sold his son or daughter into slavery for money, especially if he sold them into the hands of fierce and evil men, would be the gainer, however large might be the sum which he received? And will any one say that he is not a miserable caitiff, who remorselessly sells his own divine being to that which is most godless and detestable? Eriphyle took the necklace as the price of her husband's life, but he is taking a bribe in order to compass a worse ruin. Yes, said Glaucon, far worse and I will answer for him. Has not the intemperate been censured of old, because in him the huge multiform monster is allowed to be too much at large? Clearly. And men are blamed for pride and bad temper, when the lion and serpent element in them disproportionately grows and gains strength? Yes. And luxury and softness are blamed, because they relax and weaken the same creature, and make a coward of him? Very true. And is not a man reproached for flattery and meanness who subordinates the spirited animal to the unruly monster, and, for the sake of money, of which he can never have enough, habituates him in the days of his youth to be trampled in the mire, and from being a lion to become a monkey? True, he said. And why are mean employments and manual arts a reproach? Only because they imply a natural weakness of the higher principle, the individual is unable to control the creatures within him, but he has to court them, and his great study is how to flatter them. Such appears to be the reason. And therefore, being desirous of placing him under a rule like that of the best, we say that he ought to be the servant of the best, in whom the divine rules, not, as Thrasymachus supposed, to the injury of the servant, but because every one had better be ruled by divine wisdom dwelling within him, or, if this be impossible, then by an external authority, in order that we may be all, as far as possible, under the same government, friends and equals. True, he said. And this is clearly seen to be the intention of the law, which is the ally of the whole city, and is seen also in the authority which we exercise over children, and the refusal to let them be free until we have established in them a principle analogous to the constitution of a state, and, by cultivation of this higher element, have set up in their hearts a guardian and ruler like our own, and when this is done, they may go their ways. Yes, he said, the purpose of the law is manifest. From what point of view, then, and on what ground can we say that a man is profited by injustice or intemperance or other baseness, which will make him a worse man, even though he acquire money or power by his wickedness? From no point of view at all. What shall he profit if his injustice be undetected and unpunished? He who is undetected only gets worse, whereas he who is detected and punished has the brutal part of his nature silenced and humanized. The gentler element in him is liberated, and his whole soul is perfected and ennobled by the acquirement of justice and temperance and wisdom, more than the body ever is by receiving gifts of beauty, strength, and health, in proportion as the soul is more honorable than the body. Certainly, he said. 
To this nobler purpose the man of understanding will devote the energies of his life, and in the first place he will honor studies which impress these qualities on his soul, and will disregard others? Clearly, he said. In the next place he will regulate his bodily habit and training, and so far will he be from yielding to brutal and irrational pleasures that he will regard even health as quite a secondary matter. His first object will be not that he may be fair or strong or well, unless he is likely thereby to gain temperance, but he will always desire so to attemper the body as to preserve the harmony of the soul? Certainly he will, if he has true music in him. And in the acquisition of wealth there is a principle of order and harmony which he will also observe. He will not allow himself to be dazzled by the foolish applause of the world, and heap up riches to his own infinite harm? Certainly not, he said. He will look at the city which is within him, and take heed that no disorder occur in it, such as might arise either from superfluity or from want, and upon this principle he will regulate his property, and gain or spend according to his means? Very true. And for the same reason he will gladly accept and enjoy such honors as he deems likely to make him a better man, but those, whether private or public, which are likely to disorder his life, he will avoid? Then, if that is his motive, he will not be a statesman. By the dog of Egypt he will. In the city which is his own he certainly will, though in the land of his birth perhaps not, unless he have a divine call. I understand. You mean that he will be a ruler in the city of which we are the founders, and which exists in idea only, for I do not believe that there is such an one anywhere on earth. In heaven, I replied, there is laid up a pattern of it, methinks, which he who desires may behold, and beholding may set his own house in order. But whether such an one exists, or ever will exist in fact, is no matter, for he will live after the manner of that city, having nothing to do with any other. I think so, he said. End of Book Nine Recording by Geoffrey Edwards Book Ten, Part One of Plato's Republic. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by J. C. Guan. The Republic by Plato. Translated by Benjamin Jowett. Book Ten, Part One. Of the many excellences which I perceive in the order of our state. There is none which upon reflection pleases me better than the rule about poetry. To what do you refer? To the rejection of imitative poetry, which certainly ought not to be received. As I see far more clearly now that the parts of the soul have been distinguished. What do you mean? Speaking in confidence, for I should not like to have my words repeated to the tragedians and the rest of the imitative tribe. But I do not mind saying to you that all poetrical imitations are ruinous to the understanding of their hearers, and that the knowledge of their true nature is the only antidote to them. Explain the purport of your remark. Well, I will tell you, although I have always from my earliest youth have an awe and love of Homer which even now makes the words falter on my lips, for he is the great captain and teacher of the whole of that charming tragic company. But a man is not to be reverenced more than the truth, and therefore I will speak out. Very good, he said. Listen to me, then, or rather answer me. Put your question. Can you tell me what imitation is? For I really do not know. A likely thing, then, that I should know. Why not? For the duller eye may often see a thing sooner than the keener. Very true, he said. But in your presence, even if I had any faint notion, I could not muster courage to utter it. Will you inquire yourself? Well, then, shall we begin the inquiry in our usual manner? Whenever a number of individuals have a common name— we assume them to have also a corresponding idea or form. Do you understand me? 
I do. Let us take any common instance. There are beds and tables in the world. Plenty of them, are there not? Yes. But there are only two ideas, or forms of them. One, the idea of a bed. The other, of a table. True. And the maker of either of them makes a bed, or he makes a table for our use, in accordance with the idea. That is our way of speaking in this and similar instances. But no artificer makes the ideas themselves. How could he? Impossible. And there is another artist. I should like to know what you would say of him. Who is he? One who is the maker of all the works of all other workmen. What an extraordinary man! Wait a little, and there will be more reason for your saying so. For this is he who is able to make not only vessels for every kind, but plants and animals, himself and all other things, the earth and heaven, and the things which are in heaven or under the earth. He makes the gods also. He must be a wizard, and no mistake. Oh, you are incredulous, are you? Do you mean that there is no such maker or creator? Or that in one sense there might be a maker of all these things, but in another not? Do you see that there is a way in which you could make them all yourself? What way? An easy way enough. Or rather, there are many ways in which the feat might be quickly and easily accomplished. None quicker than that of turning a mirror round and round. You would soon enough make the sun and the heavens, and the earth and yourself, and other animals and plants and all the other things of which we were just now speaking, in the mirror. Yes, he said, but they would be appearances only. Very good, I said. You are coming to the point now, and the painter too is, as I conceive, just such another, a creator of appearances, is he not? Of course. But then, I suppose you will say that what he creates is untrue, and yet there is a sense of which the painter also creates a bed? Yes, he said, but not a real bed. And what of the maker of the bed? Were you not saying that he too makes, not the idea which, according to your view, is the essence of the bed, but only a particular bed? Yes, I did. Then, if he does not make that which exists, he cannot make true existence, but only some semblance of existence. And if any one were to say that the work of the maker of the bed, or any other workman, has real existence, he could hardly be supposed to be speaking the truth. At any rate, he replied, philosophers would say that he was not speaking the truth. No wonder, then, that his work, too, is an indistinct expression of truth. No wonder... Suppose now that, by the light of the examples just offered, we inquire who this imitator is. If you please. Well, then, here are three beds, one existing in nature, which is made by God, as I think that we may say, for no one else can be the maker. No. There is another which is the work of the carpenter. Yes. And the work of a painter is a third. Yes. Beds, then, are of three kinds, and there are three artists who superintend them. God, the maker of the bed, and the painter? Yes, there are three of them. God, whether from choice or from necessity, made one bed in nature, and one only. Two or more such ideal beds neither have been, nor ever will be made by God. Why is that? because even if he had made but two, a third would still appear behind them, which both of them would have for their idea, and that would be the ideal bed, and not the two others. Very true, he said. God knew this, and he desired to be the real maker of a real bed, not a particular maker of a particular bed, 
and therefore he created a bed which is essentially, and by nature, one only. So we believe. Shall we then speak of him as the natural author or maker of the bed? Yes, he replied, inasmuch as by the natural process of creation he is the author of this and of all other things. And what shall we say of the carpenter? Is not he also the maker of the bed? Yes. But would you call the painter a creator and maker? Certainly not. Yet, if he is not the maker, what is he in relation to the bed? I think, he said, that we may fairly designate him as the imitator of that which the others make. Good, I said. Then you call him, who is third in the descent from nature, an imitator? Certainly, he said. And the tragic poet is an imitator, and therefore, like all other imitators, he is thrice removed from the king and from the truth? That appears to be so. Then about the imitator we are agreed. And what about the painter? I would like to know whether he may be thought to imitate that which originally exists in nature, or only the creations of artists. The latter. As they are, or as they appear, you have still to determine this. What do you mean? I mean that you may look at a bed from different points of view, obliquely, or directly, or from any other point of view, and the bed will appear different. But there is no difference in reality, and the same of all things. Yes, he said, the difference is only apparent. Now let me ask you another question. Which is the art of painting designed to be? An imitation of things as they are, or as they appear, of appearance, or of reality? Of appearance. Then the imitator, I said, is a long way of the truth, and can do all things because he lightly touches on a small part of them, and that part, an image. For example, a painter will paint a cobbler, carpenter, or any other artist, though he knows nothing of their arts. And, if he is a good artist, he may deceive children or simple persons, when he shows them his picture of a carpenter from a distance, and they will fancy that they are looking at a real carpenter. Certainly. And whenever any one informs us that he has found a man who knows all the arts and all things else that anybody knows, and every single thing with a higher degree of accuracy than any other man, whoever tells us this, I think, that we can only imagine him to be a simple creature who is likely to have been deceived by some wizard or actor whom he met, and whom he thought all-knowing, because he himself was unable to analyze the nature of knowledge and ignorance and imitation. Most true. And so, when we hear persons saying that the tragedians and Homer, who is at their head, know all the arts and all things human, virtue as well as vice, and divine things too, for that the good poet cannot compose well unless he knows his subject, and that he, who has not this knowledge, can never be a poet, we ought to consider whether here also there may not be a similar illusion. Perhaps they may have come across imitators and been deceived by them. They may not have remembered when they saw their works that these were, but imitations thrice removed from the truth, and could easily be made without any knowledge of the truth, because they are appearances only and not realities. Or, after all, they may be in the right, and poets do really know the things about which they seem to the many to speak so well. The question, he said, should by all means be considered. Now do you suppose that if a person were able to make the original as well as the image, he would seriously devote himself to the image-making branch? Would he allow imitation to be the ruling principle of his life, as if he had nothing higher in him? I should say not. The real artist, who knew what he was imitating, 
would be interested in realities and not imitations, and would desire to leave as memorials of himself works many and fair, and, instead of being the author of encomiums, he would prefer to be the theme of them. Yes, he said, that would be to him a source of much greater honor and profit. Then, I said, we must put a question to Homer, not about medicine or any of the arts to which his poems only incidentally refer. We are not going to ask him, or any other poet, whether he has cured patients like Asclepius, or left behind him a school of medicine such as the Asclepiads were, or whether he only talks about medicine and other arts at second hand. But we have a right to know respecting military tactics, politics, education, which are the chiefest and noblest subjects of his poems, and we may fairly ask him about them, friend Homer. Then we say to him, If you are only in the second remove from truth, in what you say of virtue, and not in the third, not an image-maker or imitator, and if you are able to discern what pursuits make men better or worse in private or public life, Tell us what state was ever better governed by your help. The good order of Lacedaemon is due to Lycurgus, and many other cities great and small have been similarly benefited by others. But who says that you have been a good legislator to them, and have done them any good? Italy and Sicily boast of Carondus, and there is Solon, who is renowned among us. But what city has anything to say about you? Is there any city which he might name? I think not, said Glaucon. Not even the Homerids themselves pretend that he was a legislator. Well, but is there any war on record which was carried on successfully by him, or aided by his counsels when he was alive? There is not. Or is there any invention of his, applicable to the arts or to human life, such as Thales the Milesian, or Anarchasis, the Scythian, and other ingenious men have conceived, which is attributed to him? There is absolutely nothing of the kind. But if Homer never did any public service, was he privately a guide or teacher of any? Had he, in his lifetime, friends who loved to associate with him, and who handed down to posterity any Homeric way of life, such as was established by Pythagoras, who was so greatly beloved for his wisdom, and whose followers are to this day quite celebrated for the order which was named after him. Nothing of the kind is recorded of him, for surely Socrates, Creophilus, the companion of Homer, that child of flesh, whose name always makes us laugh, might be more justly ridiculed for his stupidity, if, as is said, Homer was greatly neglected by him and others in his own day when he was alive. Yes, I replied, that is the tradition. But can you imagine, Glaucon, that if Homer had really been able to educate and improve mankind, if he had possessed knowledge and not been a mere imitator, can you imagine, I say, that he would not have any followers, and been honored and loved by them? Protagoras of Abdera, and Prodicus of Theos, and a host of others, have only to whisper to their contemporaries, You will never be able to manage either your own house or your own state until you appoint us to be your ministers of education. And this ingenious device of theirs has such an effect in making men love them that their companions all but carry them about on their shoulders. And is it conceivable that the contemporaries of Homer, or again of Hesiod, would have allowed either of them to go about as rhapsodists, if they had really been able to make mankind virtuous? Would they not have been as unwilling to part with them as with gold, and have compelled them to stay at home with them? Or, if the master could not stay, then the disciples would have followed him about everywhere, until they had got education enough, Yes, Socrates, that, I think, is quite true. Then must we not infer that all these poetical individuals, 
beginning with Homer, are only imitators. They copy images of virtue and the like, but the truth they never reach. The poet is like a painter, who, as we have already observed, will make a likeness of a cobbler, though he understands nothing of cobbling, and his picture is good enough for those who know no more than he does, and judge only by colors and figures. Quite so. In like manner, the poet, with his words and phrases, may be said to lay on the colors of the several arts, himself understanding their nature only enough to imitate them, and other people, who are as ignorant as he is, and judge only from his words, imagine that if he speaks of cobbling, or of military tactics, or of anything else in meter and harmony and rhythm, he speaks very well. Such is the sweet influence which melody and rhythm by nature have. And I think that you must have observed again and again what a poor appearance the tales of poets make when stripped of the colors which music puts upon them, and recited in simple prose. Yes, he said. They are like faces, which were never really beautiful, but only blooming, and now the bloom of youth has passed away from them. Exactly. There is another point. The imitator, or maker of the image, knows nothing of true existence. He knows appearances only. Am I not right? Yes. Then let us have a clear understanding, and not be satisfied with half an explanation. Proceed. Of the painter, we say that he will paint rains, and he will paint a bit. Yes. And the worker in leather and brass will make them. Certainly. But does the painter know the right form of the bit and reins? Nay, hardly even the workers in brass and leather who make them. Only the horseman knows how to use them. He knows of their right form. Most true. End of Book Ten, Part One Recording by J. C. Guan Montreal, December 2008《Book Ten, Part Two of Plato's Republic》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by J. C. Guan The Republic by Plato Translated by Benjamin Jowett Book Ten, Part Two And may we not say the same of all things? What? That... There are three arts which are concerned with all things, one which uses, another which makes, a third which imitates them. Yes, and the excellence or beauty or truth of every structure, animate or inanimate, and of every action of man is relative to the use of which nature or the artist has intended them. True? Then... The user of them must have the greatest experience of them, and he must indicate to the maker of the good or bad qualities which develop themselves in use. For example, the flute-player will tell the flute-maker which of his flutes is satisfactory to the performer. He will tell him how he ought to make them, and the other will attend to his instructions. Of course. The one knows and therefore speaks with authority about the goodness and badness of flutes, while the other, confiding in him, will do what he is told by him. True. The instrument is the same, but about the excellence or badness of it the maker will only attain to a correct belief, and this he will gain from him who knows, by talking to him and being compelled to hear what he has to say whereas the user will have knowledge. True. But will the imitator have either? Will he know from use whether or no his drawing is correct or beautiful? Or will he have right opinion from being compelled to associate with another who knows and gives him instructions about what he should draw? Neither. Then he will no more have true opinion 
then he will have knowledge about the goodness or badness of his imitations. I suppose not. The imitative artist will be in a brilliant state of intelligence about his own creations? Nay, very much the reverse. And still, he will go on imitating without knowing what makes a thing good or bad, and may be expected, therefore, to imitate only that which appears to be good to the ignorant multitude? Just so. Thus far, then, we are pretty well agreed that the imitator has no knowledge worth mentioning of what he imitates. Imitation is only a kind of play or sport, and the tragic poets, whether they write in iambic or in heroic verse, are imitators in the highest degree? Very true. And now tell me, I conjure you, has not imitation been shown by us to be concerned with that which is thrice removed from the truth? Certainly. And what is the faculty in man to which imitation is addressed? What do you mean? I will explain. The body, which is large when seen near, appears small when seen at a distance? True. And the same object appears straight when looked at out of the water, and crooked when in the water, and the concave becomes convex, owing to the illusion about colors to which the sight is liable. Thus, every sort of confusion is revealed within us, and this is that weakness of the human mind on which the art of conjuring and of deceiving by light and shadow and other ingenious devices imposes, having an effect upon us like magic. True. And the arts of measuring and numbering and weighing come to the rescue of the human understanding. There is the beauty of them, and the apparent greater or less, or more or heavier, no longer have the mastery over us, but give way before circulation and measure and weight. Most true. And this, surely, must be the work of the calculating and rational principle of the soul? To be sure. And when this principle measures and certifies that some things are equal, or that some are greater or less than others, there occurs an apparent contradiction? True. But were we not saying that such a contradiction is impossible? The same faculty cannot have contrary opinions at the same time about the same thing. Very true. Then that part of the soul, which has an opinion contrary to measure, is not the same with that which has an opinion in accordance with measure? True. And the better part of the soul is likely to be that which trusts to measure and calculation? Certainly. And that which is opposed to them is one of the inferior principles of the soul? No doubt. This was the conclusion at which I was seeking to arrive, when I said that painting or drawing, and imitation in general, when doing their own proper work, are far removed from truth, and the companions and friends and associates of a principle within us which is equally removed from reason, and that they have no true or healthy aim. Exactly. The imitative part is an inferior who marries an inferior, and has inferior offspring. Very true. And this is confined to the sight only. Or does it extend to the hearing also, relating in fact to what we term poetry? Probably the same would be true of poetry. Do not rely, I said, on a probability derived from the analogy of painting. But let us examine further and see whether the faculty with which poetical imitation is concerned is good or bad. By all means, we may state the question thus. Imitation imitates the actions of men, whether voluntary or involuntary, on which, as they imagine, a good or bad result has ensued, and they rejoice or sorrow accordingly. Is there anything more? No, there is nothing else. But in all this variety of circumstances is the man at unity with himself, or rather, as in the instance of sight, 
there was confusion and opposition in his opinions about the same things. So here also, is there not strife and inconsistency in his life? Though I need hardly raise the question again, for I remember that all this has been already admitted, and the soul has been acknowledged by us to be full of these and ten thousand similar oppositions occurring at the same moment. And we were right, he said. Yes, I said. Thus far we were right. But there was an omission which must now be supplied. What was the omission? Were we not saying that a good man, who has the misfortune to lose his son, or anything else which is most dear to him, will bear the loss with more equanimity than another? Yes. But will he have no sorrow? Or shall we say that although he cannot help sorrowing, he will moderate his sorrow? The latter, he said, is the truer statement. Tell me, will he be more likely to struggle and hold out against his sorrow when he is seen by his equals or when he is alone? It will make a great difference whether he is seen or not. When he is by himself, he will not mind saying or doing any things which he would be ashamed of any one hearing or seeing him do? True. There is a principle of law and reason in him which bids him resist, as well as a feeling of his misfortune, which is forcing him to indulge his sorrow? True. But when a man is drawn in two opposite directions, and from the same object, this, as we affirm, necessarily implies two distinct principles in him? Certainly. One of them is ready to follow the guidance of the law. How do you mean? The law would say that to be patient under suffering is best, and that we should not give way to impatience, as there is no knowing whether such things are good or evil, and nothing is gained by impatience. Also, because no human thing is of serious importance, and grief stands in the way of that which at the moment is most required. What is most required? he asked. That we should take counsel about what has happened, and when the dice have been thrown, order our affairs in the way which reason deems best, not, like children who have had a fall, keeping hold of the part struck and wasting time in setting up a howl, but always accustoming the soul forthwith to apply a remedy, raising up that which is sickly and fallen, banishing the cry of sorrow by the healing art. Yes, he said, that is the true way of meeting the attacks of fortune. Yes, I said, and the higher principle is ready to follow this suggestion of reason. Clearly. And the other principle, which inclines us to recollection of our troubles and to lamentation, and can never have enough of them, we may call irrational, useless, and cowardly? Indeed, we may. And does not the latter, I mean the rebellious principle, furnish a great variety of materials for imitation? Whereas the wise and calm temperament, being always nearly equable, is not easy to imitate or to appreciate when imitated, especially at a public festival, when a promiscuous crowd is assembled in a theatre. For the feeling represented is one to which they are strangers. Certainly. Then, the imitative poet, who aims at being popular, is not by nature made, nor is his art intended, to please or to affect the rational principle in the soul, but he will prefer the passionate and fitful temper which is easily imitated. Clearly. And now, we may fairly take him and place him by the side of the painter, for he is like him in two ways. First, inasmuch as his creations have an inferior degree of truth, in this I say, he is like him. And he is also like him in being concerned with an inferior part of the soul, and therefore we shall be right in refusing to admit him into a well-ordered state, because he awakens and nourishes and strengthens the feelings and impairs the reason, as in a city when the evil are permitted to have authority and the good are put out of the way, so in the soul of man, as we maintain, the imitative poet implants an evil constitution, 
for he indulges the irrational nature, which has no discernment of greater and less, but thinks the same thing at one time great and at another small. He is a manufacturer of images, and is very far removed from the truth. Exactly. But we have not yet brought forward the heaviest count in our accusation, the power which poetry has of harming even the good, and there are very few who are not harmed, is surely an awful thing. Yes, certainly, if the effect is what you say. Hear and judge. The best of us, as I conceive, when we listen to a passage of Homer, or one of the tragedians, in which he represents some pitiful hero who is drawling out his sorrows in a long oration, or weeping and smiting his breast. The best of us, you know, delight in giving way to sympathy, and are in raptures at the excellence of the poet who stirs our feelings most. Yes, of course I know. But when any sorrow of our own happens to us, then you may observe that we pride ourselves on the opposite quality. We would feign to be quiet and patient. This is the manly part, and the other which delighted us in the recitation is now deemed to be the part of a woman. Very true, he said. Now, can we be right in praising and admiring another who is doing that which any one of us would abominate and be ashamed of in his own person? No, he said. That is certainly not reasonable. Nay, I say, quite reasonable from one point of view. What point of view? If you consider, I said, that when in misfortune we feel a natural hunger and desire to relieve our sorrow by weeping and lamentation, and that this feeling which is kept under control in our own calamities is satisfied and delighted by the poets, the better nature in each of us, not having been sufficiently trained by reason or habit, allows the sympathetic element to break loose because the sorrow is another's, and the spectator fancies that there can be no disgrace to himself in praising and pitying any one who comes telling him what a good man he is, and making a fuss about his troubles. He thinks that the pleasure is a gain, and why should he be supercilious and lose this, and the poem too? Few persons ever reflect, as I should imagine, that from the evil of other men something of evil is communicated to themselves. And so, the feeling of sorrow, which has gathered strength at the sight of the misfortunes of others, is with difficulty repressed in our own. How very true! And does not the same hold also of the ridiculous? There are jests, which you would be ashamed to make yourself. And yet, on the comic stage, or indeed in private, when you hear them, you are greatly amused by them, and are not at all disgusted at their unseemliness. The case of pity is repeated, there is a principle in human nature which is disposed to raise a laugh, and this which you once restrained by reason, because you were afraid of being thought a buffoon, is now let out again, and having stimulated the risable faculty at the theatre, you are betrayed unconsciously to yourself into playing the comic poet at home. Quite true, he said. And the same may be said of lust and anger, and all the other affections of desire and pain and pleasure, which are held to be inseparable from every action. In all of them poetry feeds and waters the passions, instead of drying them up. She lets them rule, although they ought to be controlled, if mankind are ever to increase in happiness and virtue. I cannot deny it. Therefore, Glaucon, I said, Whenever you meet with any of the eulogists of Homer, declaring that he has been the educator of Hellas, and that he is profitable for education and for the ordering of human things, and that you should take him up again and again, and get to know him and regulate your whole life according to him, we may love and honor those who say these things. They are excellent people, 
as far as their lights extend, and we are ready to acknowledge that Homer is the greatest of poets and first of tragedy writers. But we must remain firm in our conviction that hymns to the god and praises of famous men are the only poetry which ought to be admitted into our state. For, if you go beyond this, and allow the honeyed muse to enter, either in epic or lyric verse, not law and the reason of mankind, which by common consent have ever been deemed best, but pleasure and pain will be the rulers of our state. That is most true, he said. And now, since we have reverted to the subject of poetry, let this our defence serve to show the reasonableness of our former judgment in sending away out of our state an art having the tendencies which we have described. For reason constrained us, but that she may not impute to us any harshness or want of politeness. Let us tell her that there is an ancient quarrel between philosophy and poetry, of which there are many proofs, such as the saying of, quote, the yelping hound howling at her lord, end quote, or of one, quote, mighty in the vain talk of fools, end quote, end quote, the mob of sages circumventing Zeus, end quote, and the, quote, subtle thinkers who are beggars after all, end quote. And there are innumerable other signs of ancient enmity between them. Notwithstanding this, let us assure our sweet friend and the sister arts of imitation, that if she will only prove her title to exist in a well-ordered state, we shall be delighted to receive her. We are very conscious of her charms, but we may not, on that account, betray the truth. I dare say, Glaucon, that you are as much charmed by her as I am, especially when she appears in Homer. Yes, indeed, I am greatly charmed. Shall I propose, then, that she be allowed to return from exile, but upon this condition only, that she makes a defence of herself in lyrical or some other metre? Certainly. And we may further grant to those of her defenders, who are lovers of poetry, and yet not poets, the permission to speak in prose on her behalf. Let them show not only that she is pleasant, but also useful to states and to human life, and we will listen in a kindly spirit. For if this can be proved, we shall surely be the gainers. I mean, if there is a use in poetry, as well as a delight? Certainly, he said, we shall be the gainers. If her defence fails, then, my dear friend, like other persons who are enamoured of something, but put a restraint upon themselves when they think their desires are opposed to their interest, so, too, must we, after the manner of lovers, give her up, though not without a struggle. We, too, are inspired by that love of poetry which the education of noble states has implanted in us, and, therefore, we would have her appear at her best and truest. But so long as she is unable to make good her defence, this argument of ours shall be a charm to us, which we will repeat to ourselves while we listen to her strains, that we may not fall away into the childish love of her which captivates the many. At all events, we are well aware that poetry, being such as we have described, is not to be regarded seriously as attaining to the truth, and he who listens to her, fearing for the safety of the city which is within him, should be on his guard against her seductions and make our words his law. Yes, he said, I quite agree with you. Yes, I said, my dear Glaucon, for great is the issue at stake, greater than appears, whether a man is to be good or bad. And what will any one be profited if, under the influence of honour, or money, or power, I, or, under the excitement of poetry, he neglect justice and virtue? Yes, he said. I have been convinced by the argument, as I believe that any one else would have been. And yet, no mention has been made of the greatest prizes and rewards which await virtue. 
What? Are there any greater still? If there are, they must be of an inconceivable greatness. Why, I said, what was ever great in a short time? The whole period of threescore years and ten is surely but a little thing in comparison with eternity. Say rather nothing, he replied. And should an immortal being seriously think of this little space rather than of the whole? Of the whole, certainly. But what do you ask? End of Book Ten, Part Two Recording by J. C. Guan Montreal, December 2008Book 10, Part 3 of Plato's Republic. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Don One World. The Republic by Plato. Translated by Benjamin Jewett. Book 10, Part 3. Are you aware, I said, that the soul of a man is immortal and imperishable? He looked at me in astonishment and said, No, by heaven, and are you really prepared to maintain this? Yes, I said, I ought to be, and you too. There is no difficulty in proving it. I see great difficulty, but I should like to hear you state this argument of which you make so light. Listen, then. I am attending. There is a thing which you call good and another which you call evil? Yes, he replied. Would you agree with me in thinking that the corrupting and destroying element is the evil, and the saving and improving element the good? Yes. And you admit that everything has a good and also an evil, as ophthalmia is an evil of the eyes, and disease of the whole body, as mildew is of corn, and rot of timber, or rust of copper and iron. In everything, or in almost everything, there is an inherent evil and disease? Yes, he said. And anything which is infected by any of these evils is made evil, and at last wholly dissolves and dies. True. Then vice and evil which is inherent in each is the destruction of each. And if this does not destroy them, there is nothing that will. For good certainly will not destroy them, nor again that which is neither good nor evil. Certainly not. If, then, we find any nature which having this inherent corruption cannot be dissolved or destroyed, we may be certain that of such a nature there is no destruction. That may be assumed. Well, I said, and is there no evil which corrupts the soul? Yes, he said, there are all the evils which we were just now passing in review, unrighteousness, intemperance, cowardice, ignorance, but does any of these dissolve or destroy her? And here do not let us fall into the error of supposing that the unjust and foolish man, when he is detected, perishes through his own injustice, which is an evil of the soul. Take the analogy of the body. The evil of the body is a disease which wastes and reduces and annihilates the body. And all the things of which we were just now speaking come to annihilation through their own corruption attaching to them and inhering in them and so destroying them. Is not this true? Yes. Consider the soul in a like manner. Does the injustice or other evil which exists in the soul waste and consume her? Do they by attaching to the soul and inhering in her at the last bring her to death and so separate her from the body? Certainly not. And yet, I said, it is unreasonable to suppose that anything can perish from without through affection of external evil which could not be destroyed from within by a corruption of its own. It is, he replied. Consider, I said, Glaucon, that even the badness of food, whether staleness, decomposition, or any other bad quality, when confined to the actual food, is not supposed to destroy the body, although... If the badness of food communicates corruption to the body, then we should say that the body has been destroyed by a corruption of itself, which is the disease brought on by this, but that the body, being one thing, can be destroyed, 
by the badness of food, which is another, and which does not engender any natural infection. This we shall absolutely deny. Very true. And on the same principle, unless some bodily evil can produce an evil of the soul, which we must not suppose that the soul, which is one thing, can be dissolved by any merely external evil which belongs to another. Yes, he said, there is reason in that. Either then, let us refute this conclusion, or, while it remains unrefuted, let us never say that fever, or any other disease, or the knife put to the throat, or even the cutting up of the whole body into the minutest pieces, can destroy the soul, until she herself is proved to become more unholy or unrighteous in consequence of these things being done to the body, but that the soul, or anything else if not destroyed by an internal evil, can be destroyed by an external one, is not to be affirmed by any man. And surely, he replied, no one will ever prove that the souls of men become more unjust in consequence of death. But if someone who would rather not admit the immortality of the soul boldly denies this, and says that the dying do really become more evil and unrighteous, then if the speaker is right, I suppose that injustice, like disease, must be assumed to be fatal to the unjust, and that those who take this disorder die by the natural inherent power of destruction which evil has, and which kills them sooner or later, but in quite another way from that in which at present the wicked receive death at the hands of others as the penalty for their deeds. Nay, he said, in that case injustice, if fatal to the unjust, would not be so very terrible to him, for he would be delivered from evil. But I rather suspect the opposite to be the truth, and that injustice which, if it have the power, will murder others, keep the murderer alive, aye, and well awake too, so far removed is her dwelling place from being a house of death. True, I said, and if the inherent natural vice or evil of the soul is unable to destroy or kill her, hardly will that which is appointed to be the destruction of some other body destroy a soul or anything else except that of which it was appointed to be the destruction. Yes, that can hardly be. But the soul which cannot be destroyed by an evil, whether inherent or external, must exist forever, and if existing forever, must be immortal. Certainly. That is the conclusion, I said. And if a true conclusion, then the souls must always be the same, for if none be destroyed, they will not diminish in number, neither will they increase, for the increase of their mortal natures must come from something mortal, and all things would thus end in immortality. Very true. But this we cannot believe. Reason will not allow us, any more than we can believe the soul, in her truest nature, to be full of variety and difference and dissimilarity. What do you mean? he said. The soul, I said, being, as is now proven, immortal, must be the fairest of compositions and cannot be compounded of many elements. Certainly not. Her immortality is demonstrated by the previous argument, and there are many other proofs. But to see her as she really is, not as we now behold her, marred by communion with the body and other miseries, you must contemplate her with the eye of reason, in her original purity, and then her beauty will be revealed, and justice and injustice and all the things which we have described will be manifested more clearly. Thus far, we have spoken the truth concerning her as she appears at present, but we must remember also that we have seen her only in a condition which may be compared to that of the sea god Glaucus, whose original image can hardly be discerned because his natural members are broken off and crushed and damaged by the waves in all sorts of ways and encrustations have grown over them of seaweed and shells and stones, so that he is more like some monster than he is to his own natural form. And the soul which we behold is in a similar condition, disfigured by ten thousand ills. But not there, Glaucon, not there must we look. Where then? At her love of wisdom. Let us see whom she affects, and what society and converse she seeks, in virtue of her near kindred, with the immortal and eternal and divine. Also, how different she would become if wholly following this superior principle 
and borne by a divine impulse out of the ocean in which she now is, and disengaged from the stones and shells and things of earth and rock, which in wild variety spring up around her because she feeds upon earth, and is overgrown by good things of this life as they are termed, then would we see her as she is, and know whether she have one shape or many, or what her nature is, of her affections and of the forms which she takes in this present life, I think that we have now said enough. True, he replied, and thus I said we have fulfilled the conditions of the argument. We have not introduced the rewards and glories of justice, which, as you were saying, are to be found in Homer and Hesiod. But justice in her own nature has been shown to be best for the soul in her own nature. Let a man do what is just, whether he have the ring of Gaius or not. And even if in addition to the ring of Gaius, he puts on a helmet of Hades. Very true. And now, Glaucon, there will be no harm in further enumerating how many and how great are the rewards which justice and the other virtues procure to the soul from gods and men, both in life and after death. Certainly not, he said. Will you repay me, then, what you borrowed in the argument? What did I borrow? The assumption that the just man should appear unjust, and the unjust just. For you were of the opinion that even if the true state of the case could not possibly escape the eyes of God and men, still this admission ought to be made for the sake of the argument, in order that pure justice might be weighed against pure injustice. Do you remember? I should be much to blame if I had forgotten. Then, as the cause is decided, I demand on behalf of justice that the estimation of which she is held by gods and men, and which we acknowledge to be her due, should now be restored to her by us, since she has been shown to confer reality and not to deceive those who truly possess her, let what has been taken from her be given back, that so she may win that palm of appearance which is hers also, and which she gives to her own. The demand, he said, is just. In the first place, I said, and this is the first thing which you will have to give back, the nature both of the just and unjust is truly known to the gods. Granted. And if they are both known to them, one must be the friend and the other the enemy of the gods, as we admitted from the beginning. True. And the friend of the gods must be supposed to receive from them all things at their best, excepting only such evil as is the necessary consequence of former sins. Certainly. Then this must be our notion of the just man, that even when he is in poverty or sickness, or any other seeming misfortune, all things will in the end work together for good to him in life and death. For the gods have a care of any one whose desire is to become just and to be like God, as far as man can attain the divine likeness by the pursuit of virtue. Yes, he said, if he is like God, he will surely not be neglected by him. And of the unjust, may not the opposite be supposed? Certainly. Such then, are the palms of victory which the gods give the just? That is my conviction. And what do they receive of men? Look at things as they really are, and you will see that the clever unjust are in the case of runners who run well from the starting place to the goal, but not back again from the goal. They go off at a great pace, but in the end only look foolish, slinking away with their ears draggling on their shoulders, and without a crown, but the true runner comes to the finish and receives the prize and is crowned. And this is the way with the just. He who endures to the end of every action and occasion of his entire life has a good report and carries off the prize which men have to bestow. True. End of Book 10, Part 3 Recording by Don One World, Waukesha, Wisconsin Book 10, Part 4 of Plato's Republic. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Preston McConkie. The Republic by Plato. Translated by Benjamin Jowett. Book 10, Part 4. 
And now you must allow me to repeat of the just the blessings which you were attributing to the fortunate unjust. I shall say of them what you were saying of the others, that as they grow older they become rulers in their own city if they care to be. They marry whom they like, and give in marriage to whom they will. All that you said of the others I now say of these. And on the other hand, of the unjust, I say that the greater number, even though they escape in their youth, are found out at last and look foolish at the end of their course. And when they come to be old and miserable, are flouted alike by stranger and citizen. They are beaten, and then come those things unfit for ears polite, as you truly term them. They will be racked, and have their eyes burnt out, as you were saying. And you may suppose that I have repeated the remainder of your tale of horrors. But will you let me assume, without reciting them, that these things are true? Certainly, he said, what you say is true. These, then, are the prizes and rewards and gifts which are bestowed upon the just by gods and men in this present life, in addition to the other good things which justice of herself provides. Yes, he said, and they are fair and lasting. And yet, I said, all these are as nothing, either in number or greatness, in comparison with those other recompenses which await both just and unjust after death. And you ought to hear them, and then both just and unjust will have received from us a full payment of the debt which the argument owes to them. Speak, he said, there are few things which I would more gladly hear. Well, I said, I will tell you a tale. Not one of the tales which Odysseus tells to the hero Alcinous. Yet this, too, is a tale of a hero, Ur, the son of Armenius, a Pamphylian by birth. He was slain in battle, and ten days afterwards, when the bodies of the dead were taken up, already in a state of corruption, his body was found unaffected by decay, and carried away home to be buried. And on the twelfth day, as he was lying on the funeral pile, he returned to life and told them what he had seen in the other world. He said that when his soul left the body, he went on a journey with a great company, and that they came to a mysterious place at which there were two openings in the earth. They were near together, and over against them were two other openings in the heaven above. In the intermediate space there were judges seated, who commanded the just, after they had given judgment on them, and had bound their sentences in front of them, to ascend by the heavenly way on the right hand. And in like manner the unjust were bidden by them to descend by the lower way on the left hand. These also bore the symbols of their deeds, but fastened on their backs. He drew near, and they told him that he was to be the messenger who would carry the report of the other world to men, and they bade him hear and see all that was to be heard and seen in that place. Then he beheld and saw, on one side, the souls departing at either opening of heaven and earth when sentence had been given on them, and at the two other openings other souls, some ascending out of the earth, dusty and worn with travel, some descending out of heaven, clean and bright, and arriving ever and anon they seemed to have come from a long journey, and they went forth with gladness into the meadow, where they encamped as at a festival, and those who knew one another embraced and conversed the souls which came from earth curiously inquiring about the things above, and the souls which came from heaven about the things beneath. And they told one another of what had happened by the way, those from below weeping and sorrowing at the remembrance of the things which they had endured and seen in their journey beneath the earth. Now the journey lasted a thousand years. While those from above were describing heavenly delights and visions of inconceivable beauty. The story, Glaucon, would take too long to tell. But the sum was this. He said that for every wrong which they had done to any one, they suffered tenfold, or once in a hundred years, such being reckoned to be the length of man's life, and the penalty being thus paid ten times in a thousand years. If, for example, there were any who had been the cause of many deaths, or had betrayed or enslaved cities or armies, or been guilty of any other evil behavior, for each and all of their offenses they received punishment ten times over, and the rewards of beneficence and justice and holiness were in the same proportion. I need hardly repeat what he said concerning young children, dying almost as soon as they were born. Of piety and impiety to gods and parents, and of murderers, there were retributions other and greater far, which he described. He mentioned that he was present when one of the spirits asked another, Where is Ardius the Great? Now this Ardius lived a thousand years before the time of Ur. He had been the tyrant of some city of Pamphylia, and had murdered his aged father and his elder brother, and was said to have committed many other abominable crimes. The answer of the other spirit was, he comes not hither, and will never come. And this, said he, was one of the dreadful sights which we ourselves witnessed. 
We were at the mouth of the cavern, and, having completed all our experiences, were about to reascend when of a sudden Ardius appeared and several others, most of whom were tyrants, and there were also besides the tyrants private individuals who had been great criminals. They were just, as they fancied, about to return into the upper world, but the mouth, instead of admitting them, gave a roar whenever any of these incurable sinners, or someone who had not been sufficiently punished, tried to ascend. And then wild men of fiery aspect, who were standing by and heard the sound, seized and carried them off. And Ardius and the others, they bound head and foot and hand, and threw them down and flayed them with scourges, and dragged them along the road at the side, carting them on thorns like wool, and declaring to the passers-by what were their crimes, and that they were being taken away to be cast into hell. And of all the many terrors which they had endured, he said, there were none like the terror which each of them felt at that moment, lest they should hear the voice. And when there was silence, one by one they ascended with exceeding joy. These, said Ur, were the penalties and retributions, and there were blessings as great. Now when the spirits which were in the meadow had tarried seven days, on the eighth they were obliged to proceed on their journey, and, on the fourth day after, he said that they came to a place where they could see from above a line of light, straight as a column, extending right through the whole heaven and through the earth, in color resembling the rainbow, only brighter and purer. Another day's journey brought them to the place, and there, in the midst of the light, they saw the ends of the chains of heaven let down from above. For this light is the belt of heaven, and holds together the circle of the universe, like the undergirders of a trireme. From these ends is extended the spindle of necessity, on which all the revolutions turn. The shaft and hook of this spindle are made of steel, and the whorl is made partly of steel, and also partly of other materials. Now the whorl is in form like the whorl used on earth, and the description of it implied that there is one large hollow whorl which is quite scooped out, and into this is fitted another lesser one, and another, and another, and four others, making eight in all, like vessels which fit into one another. The whorls show their edges on the upper side, and on the lower side altogether form one continuous whorl. This is pierced by the spindle, which is driven home through the center on the eighth. The first and outermost whorl has the rim broadest, and the seven inner whorls are narrower, in the following proportions. The sixth is next to the first in size, the fourth next to the sixth, then comes the eighth, the seventh is fifth, the fifth is sixth, the third is seventh, last and eighth comes the second. The largest, or fixed stars, is spangled, and the seventh, our sun, is brightest. The eighth, or moon, colored by the reflected light of the seventh, the second and fifth, Saturn and Mercury, are in color like one another, and yellower than the preceding. The third, Venus, has the whitest light. The fourth, Mars, is reddish. The sixth, Jupiter, is in whiteness second. Now the whole spindle has the same motion, but as the whole revolves in one direction, the seven inner circles move slowly in the other, and of these the swiftest is the eighth. Next in swiftness are the seventh, sixth, and fifth, which move together. Third in swiftness appeared to move according to the law of this reversed motion, the fourth. The third appeared fourth, and the second fifth. The spindle turns on the knees of necessity, and on the upper surface of each circle is a siren, who goes round with them, hymning a single tone or note. The eight together form one harmony, and round about, at equal intervals, there is another band, three in number, each sitting upon her throne. These are the fates, daughters of necessity, who are clothed in white robes and have chaplets upon their heads, Lachesis and Clotho and Atropos, who accompany with their voices the harmony of the sirens, Lachesis singing of the past, Clotho of the present, Atropos of the future, Clotho from time to time, assisting with the torch of her right hand the revolution of the outer circle of the whorl or spindle, and Atropos with her left hand touching and guiding the inner ones, and Lachesis laying hold of either in turn, first with one hand and then with the other. When Ur and the spirits arrived, their duty was to go at once to Lachesis, but first of all there came a prophet who arranged them in order. Then he took from the knees of Lachesis lots and samples of lives, and having mounted a high pulpit, spoke as follows. Hear the word of Lachesis, the daughter of necessity. Mortal souls, behold a new cycle of life and mortality. Your genius will not be allotted to you, but you will choose your genius, and let him who draws the first lot have the first choice, and the life which he chooses shall be his destiny. 
Virtue is free, and as a man honors or dishonors her, he will have more or less of her. The responsibility is with the chooser. God is justified. When the interpreter had thus spoken, he scattered lots indifferently among them all, and each of them took up the lot which fell near him, all but Er himself. He was not allowed. And each, as he took his lot, perceived the number which he had obtained. Then the interpreter placed on the ground before them the samples of lives. And there were many more lives than the souls present, and they were of all sorts. There were lives of every animal, and of man in every condition. And there were tyrannies among them, some lusting out the tyrant's life, others which broke off in the middle and came to an end in poverty and exile and beggary. And there were lives of famous men, some who were famous for their form and beauty, as well as for their strength and success in games, or, again, for their birth and the qualities of their ancestors, and some who were the reverse of famous for the opposite qualities. And of women likewise. There was not, however, any definite character in them, because the soul, when choosing a new life, must of necessity become different. But there was every other quality, and they all mingled with one another, and also with elements of wealth and poverty and disease and health, and there were mean states also. And here, my dear Glaucon, is the supreme peril of our human state, and therefore the utmost care should be taken. Let each one of us leave every other kind of knowledge, and seek and follow one thing only, if peradventure he may be able to learn, and may find some other one who will make him able to learn and discern between good and evil, and so to choose always and everywhere the better life, as he has opportunity. He should consider the bearing of all these things which have been mentioned severally and collectively upon virtue. He should know what the effect of beauty is when combined with poverty or wealth in a particular soul, and what are the good and evil consequences of noble and humble birth, or private and public station, of strength and weakness, of cleverness and dullness, and of all the natural and acquired gifts of the soul, and the operation of them when conjoined. He will then look at the nature of the soul, and from the consideration of all these qualities he will be able to determine which is the better and which is the worse. And so he will choose, giving the name of evil to the life which will make his soul more unjust, and good to the life which will make his soul more just. All else he will disregard. For we have seen and know that this is the best choice both in life and after death. A man must take with him into the world below an adamantine faith in truth and right, that there too he may be undazzled by the desire of wealth or the other allurements of evil, lest, coming upon tyrannies and similar villainies, he do irremediable wrongs to others, and suffer yet worse himself. But let him know how to choose the mean, and avoid the extremes on either side as far as possible, not only in this life, but in all that which is to come. For this is the way of happiness. And according to the report of the messenger from the other world, this was what the prophet said at the time. Even for the last comer, if he chooses wisely and will live diligently, there is appointed a happy and not undesirable existence. Let not him who chooses first be careless, and let not the last despair. And when he had spoken, he who had the first choice came forward, and in a moment chose the greatest tyranny. His mind having been darkened by folly and sensuality, he had not thought out the whole matter before he chose, and did not at first sight perceive that he was fated, among other evils, to devour his own children. But when he had time to reflect, and saw what was in the lot, he began to beat his breast and lament over his choice, forgetting the proclamation of the prophet. For instead of throwing the blame of his misfortune on himself, he accused chance and the gods and everything rather than himself. Now he was one of those who came from heaven, and in a former life had dwelt in a well-ordered state. But his virtue was a matter of habit only, and he had no philosophy. And it was true of others, who were similarly overtaken, that the great number of them came from heaven, and therefore they had never been schooled by trial, whereas the pilgrims who came from earth, having themselves suffered and seen others suffer, were not in a hurry to choose. And owing to this inexperience of theirs, and also because the lot was a chance, many of the souls exchanged a good destiny for an evil, or an evil for a good. For if a man had always on his arrival in this world dedicated himself from the first to sound philosophy, and had been moderately fortunate in the number of the lot, he might, as the messenger reported, be happy here, and also his journey to another life and return to this, instead of being rough and underground, would be smooth and heavenly. Most curious, he said, was the spectacle, sad and laughable and strange. 
for the choice of the souls was in most cases based on their experience of a previous life. There he saw the soul which had once been Orpheus, choosing the life of a swan out of enmity to the race of women, hating to be born of a woman because they had been his murderers. He beheld also the soul of Thamorus, choosing the life of a nightingale, birds on the other hand like the swan and other musicians wanting to be men. The soul which obtained the twentieth lot chose the life of a lion, and this was the soul of Ajax, the son of Telamon, who would not be a man, remembering the injustice which was done him in the judgment about the arms. The next was Agamemnon, who took the life of an eagle because, like Ajax, he hated human nature by reason of his sufferings. About the middle came the lot of Atalanta. She, seeing the great fame of an athlete, was unable to resist the temptation, and after her there followed the soul of Epius, the son of Panopius, passing into the nature of a woman cunning in the arts, and far away among the last who chose, the soul of the jester Thersites was putting on the form of a monkey. There came also the soul of Odysseus, having yet to make a choice, and his lot happened to be the last of them all. Now the recollection of former toils had disenchanted him of ambition, and he went about for a considerable time in search of the life of a private man who had no cares. He had some difficulty in finding this, which was lying about and had been neglected by everybody else, and when he saw it, he said that he would have done the same, had his lot been first instead of last, and that he was delighted to have it. And not only did men pass into animals— but I must also mention that there were animals, tame and wild, who changed into one another and into corresponding human natures, the good into the gentle, and the evil into the savage, in all sorts of combinations. All the souls had now chosen their lives, and they went in the order of their choice to Lachesis, who sent with them the genius whom they had severally chosen, to be the guardian of their lives and the fulfiller of the choice. This genius led the souls first to Clotho, and drew them within the revolution of the spindle impelled by her hand, thus ratifying the destiny of each, and then, when they were fastened to this, carried them to Atropos, who spun the threads and made them irreversible, whence, without turning round, they passed beneath the throne of necessity, and when they had all passed, they marched on in a scorching heat to the plain of forgetfulness, which was a barren waste, destitute of trees and verdure, and then, towards evening, they encamped by the river of unmindfulness, whose water no vessel can hold. Of this they were all obliged to drink a certain quantity, and those who were not saved by wisdom drank more than was necessary, and each one as he drank forgot all things. Now after they had gone to rest, about the middle of the night there was a thunderstorm and earthquake, and then in an instant they were driven upwards in all manner of ways to their birth, like stars shooting. He himself was hindered from drinking the water, but in what manner or by what means he returned to the body he could not say. Only in the morning, awaking suddenly, he found himself lying on the pyre. And thus, Glaucon, the tale has been saved, and has not perished, and will save us if we are obedient to the word spoken. And we shall pass safely over the river of forgetfulness, and our soul will not be defiled. Wherefore my counsel is that we hold fast ever to the heavenly way, and follow after justice and virtue always. Considering that the soul is immortal, and able to endure every sort of good, and every sort of evil, thus shall we ever live, dear to one another and to the gods, both while remaining here, and when, like conquerors in the games who go round to gather gifts, we receive our reward. And it shall be well with us, both in this life, and in the pilgrimage of a thousand years which we have been describing. End of Book Ten End of Plato's Republic, translated by Benjamin Jowett Recording by Preston McConkie, Annabella, Utah.